Hello, you guys. How are you all? Thank you guys for being here. Um, hey, Adrian. Hey, AMC. Mary Jane Doe. Hey, Pretty Bugs Tail. Sky Love. Hello, KPM. Hey, Music City Mom. Nola Chick. Mama Four. Hey, Shauna. Hey, Midwest Me Mall. Hey, Kate Kate. Becky P. Hello, Shelly Daniels. Hi, Brandy. Melanie. Let's see. Neat Noodle. Pointer Lover. Lisa. Hello, Crystal Lynn. Good to see you. Hey, Pursuing Understanding, Hippie Chip, Katie, Aries Girl, Butterfly Kisses, Stephanie, um, Tan Trey Brown. Hello, good to see you. Hey, Amy. Hello, Katie, too. I wanted to take just a second. I'm going to bring the girls up immediately, but first, I just want to say Butterfly Kisses is a young lady who's been part of the channel here um for a while now and she's been telling us you know every she's in recovery and every day she would always put in the chat what day she's on and today she has made it to one year and i remember when you were at like day one you know all the way back in the beginning so i just wanted to take a second and say i am so proud of you that is absolutely wonderful um that is really exciting um so yeah hey clicker hey nails and braids by kim okay let me bring the girls up hello you guys hey hey how are you i guys? just i just read I'm patricia's here. comment where she said that she thought the title said uh leticia stalk portable chaos affidavit <laughs> and i just thought that was perfect yeah, did i it. spell it wrong no, no, she I, just, she read it wrong. She glanced oh, at it. <laughs> I was like, did I, because for a minute, I wasn't sure I spelled probable correctly. <laughs> On the th yeah, Jen made our awesome thumbnail. Hey, Shelly. Um, hey, Allison. That's which, funny, Jen, though. You make some of the best thumbnails I've ever seen, I got to say. You are absolutely wonderful at it. And yeah, so thank you so much. Oh, thank, you, you. thank you. You guys go check out the two Jens channel. Both are in the description box. I'm trying to do that on all the lives that we do together. And I'm going to drop them in the chat now. And actually, so we've been talking about doing this live, you guys, for a while. Because in the Brian Koberger case, you know, it's very popular right now. A lot of people are talking about it. And um, the probable cause affidavit has been released. And we've always talked about, you know, what's out in the affidavit versus what comes out at trial. Well, for this one, um, it's going to be very interesting because we're going to go through Letitia's affidavit. Now we know so much that's came out at trial and stuff. But while we go through this, I want you guys to just like try to make your mind clear, you know, uh, forget what you know for just a few moments if you can. And then um, we'll go through all of this stuff together. But something interesting to note before we get started Gannon had not been found when the, when she was um, arrested. So, but yeah, so we're going to go through all of that. But another really cool thing about the affidavit is where I got it was from, um, where I downloaded it today this time was from Crime Curious's website. So if you guys have not checked out her website, you should go check it out because it is absolutely awesome. Tons of case resources. And it was super simple for me to go in, get the affidavit, download the PDF, and you can do that on the case file or all kinds of other things. So, oh, and she fell off. <laughs> hey, Vanessa. <laughs> Tony. But yeah, I went and got it from her website. I'm excited to go through this with you guys. Me We've too, me too. For a minute, haven't we? Yes. So, okay, let me go ahead and pull it up because I got it right here. Thank you guys for being here. I saw a couple people first time um, in the live chat. So welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. And then Lynn says, true crime crazy. I'm sorry you need surgery tomorrow, but we will definitely be thinking about you and sending all the good vibes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I pulled this from your website, Curious Jen. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry for jumping out. That's because I was messing around in chat and uh, I'm actually in the dark and I just hit the wrong button. <laughs> well, um, another interesting thing about this is when it first dropped, it actually was not supposed to be released. And somebody in that worked there um, leaked the affidavit and they've actually been charged and everything like their court process played out much faster than Letitia's. But um 
yeah, I think that's really interesting. It wasn't supposed to be, oh, I see your comment now. Um, it wasn't supposed to be released when it was. Oh. Hello, my beautiful friends. I would like to ask everyone to please keep me in your thoughts and prayers. I have to have surgery tomorrow on my heart. Oh, absolutely. True crime crazy. We love you and will be. Absolutely. Neat noodle. <laughs> okay, so I'll just go ahead and get started. I'm not going to read every single word like this beginning. We, um, it's Jessica Bethel, who is who is the one who filled this out. Um, and she wants to submit the following facts to demonstrate probable cause to believe that on or about January 27th of 2020 in the county of El Paso in the state of Colorado, the defendant, Letitia Stalk, also known as Letitia Hardin, did commit the following offenses. Murder in the first degree, child under 12 position of trust, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with the deceased human body and tampering with physical evidence. Now, those child under 12 and position of trust, I know that they those are like the, ex, what's the word, extenuating circumstances. How do I say that, Jen? Aggravating factors. Yeah, they they are aggravating factors. And there um, were more added after she was, after he was found. I mean, yes, added several more after that. But, okay, let's see. The facts in this affidavit come from her personal observations, training, and experience. Um, in summary, and as will be set forth below, probable cause exists to issue an arrest warrant for Letitia. The vast array of investigative techniques in this investigation have produced a voluminous amount of evidence in support of the requested warrant. And they go through, you know, all the, all the places that they got warrants, like their social media, Life360, that stuff. Um, historical cellular records and historical cell site details were analyzed. Okay, so here are the facts in support of probable cause. So the Stalk family is a blended family and all will be discussed at various points below. This representation purposely has little details in order to give an overview of the family structure. You guys know all of that. We have Al and Letitia, Harley, who is 17, Gannon, who was 11, Lena, who was 8. They had these vehicles that will be discussed below, a red Nissan Frontier, that is Al's truck. We have the Tiguan, and then we have Harley's vehicle. We also have a rental car, an Altima, and then a white Kia Rio, another rental car. We have the one rental car that Letitia got and one that Aunt Brenda got, which is the Altima. Letitia Stalk is the last person known to investigators to see 11-year-old Gannon Stalk alive. Letitia is Gannon's stepmother and was Gannon's only adult supervision in the days preceding and on the day of his murder. At the time of Gannon's murder, Letitia was employed by School District 20 as an assistant teacher, although I've also learned that she is no longer employed there. She was able to locate a criminal history and learned that in North Carolina, she was convicted after a trial for communicating threats, a misdemeanor, but I was not able to locate sentencing information. Now, do we know more about that? No, that's the first time I've even hearing that. Jen, what about you? Read that again. So she had a prior criminal history where she was convicted and had a trial for communicating threats. It was a misdemeanor, but they weren't able to locate sentencing information, but they do put the case number in here. Yeah, that was when she was in high school. She called in a bomb threat. Oh, wow. A bomb threat. Yeah. She also stole the driver's ed car. Oh, my God. What? Yeah. Yeah. Letitia, what Letitia, Letitia. What the fuck? Yeah, she's a whole mess. Oh my God Almighty. Um, you guys, while I'm reading, I just want you to know I really like to keep up with chat. Um, but while I'm reading, I obviously can't read chat and this at the same time. So um, I will watch it after. But you guys, if there's anything important, will you let me know? Yeah, let me <laughs> the put the chat on the let me put the TV on so I can see well, it. It's like that's, you know, in the first letter that she wrote to the judge, um, she was she was very sure to point out that she had, you know, when, where she was talking about she was a pillar in her community in South Carolina, uh, that she had no adult 
record, um, which is, you know, I guess it's true. I mean, we don't, I don't, I still don't know what happened with that whole, you know, jumping on 2010 Ken's back and biting him and all of that, because it was my understanding that he did call the police on her, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure she talked her way out of it. Yeah. Something happened. Wow. Um, okay. So they also note her, this is not a criminal offense or anything, but she breached a contract with uh, the North Carolina State Board as far as her teaching license there. So she lost her, she, her teach, her North Carolina teaching certificate was suspended in May of 2016. Hmm. She was engaging in unprofessional conduct, willfully neglecting her duty and failing to comply with the provisions of her contract. Imagine that. <laughs> Then we have Eugene Albert Stalk. He is the biological father. He was deployed with the National Guard from the 25th to the 28th. Summary of a multi-agency missing person investigation in Colorado. Of note, and in some portions of this affidavit, depending on the date of events being discussed, the investigation may be referred to as a missing persons investigation or a murder investigation. For the purposes of the affidavit, this affidavit, they are indeed one and the same. The subsequent information primarily surrounds the period of Monday, January 27th to Wednesday, January 29th. Investigators have taken independent steps to corroborate information received throughout the investigation and in most circumstances have video footage, cellular communication and location records, security system records or other records to support the below claims. This summary section is only meant to give the court an overview of the investigation. On January 27th at 1855, Letitia Stalk reported Gannon missing. In summary, Letitia stated Gannon was supposed to be home approximately one hour ago and she was unable to locate him at his friend's house. Her story dramatically changed multiple times over the following days. As will be discussed below, investigators do not believe Letitia went to any neighboring houses to attempt to locate Gannon and was one of the many lies told by Letitia during the investigation. Letitia was unable to provide the actual location of the home she went to, the names of Gannon's friends he was supposed to be playing with, or the names of the parents of Gannon's friends. Now, we did see in the case file, now that we now looking back, we know that it was said she went looking for Gannon at a house on Sunday, you know, the day before he went missing, which is interesting, but yeah, Giovanna can't wait for the book and loves our channels. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you so yeah, much. I can't, I can't wait for it either. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm so ready. Done? I wonder I'm how you're so going to feel. Ready. <laughs> you won't know what to do when you're done. <laughs> um, so deputies responded to her residence at 6627 Mandan Drive. Some of the interactions between the responding deputies and Letitia were captured on a body-worn camera. A missing person investigation was initiated and in the coming days developed into a murder investigation. A tip line was established. Um, let's see. There were two ransom notes received by email demanding money and in the form of Bitcoin in exchange for Gannon's return. Investigators oh took steps Not to, Bitcoin. What? to validate these ransom notes um, and they couldn't. It was based uh, from a foreign based email um, that's accessible by multiple individuals and they were unable to trace the user of the IP addresses and believe the ransom notes to be fraudulent and designed as like somebody's trying to scheme for money. But, Probably Letitia. Yeah. Letitia. Well, one of, one of her Google searches from February 21st said, how do I hide my IP address for an email? So, mm. I mean, that was an actual February 21st. Google search from Letitia. Huh. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Letitia Stout strikes again. Wow. Letitia initially claimed that, sorry, I was taking a drink, initially claimed that she last saw Gannon on the 27th when he left their residence to play with his friend somewhere around 15, 15 hours. Based on the facts outlined below and Letitia's statement to a sheriff's office dispatcher, Letitia is the last person that ever saw Gannon alive. 
Letitia stated she attempted to find him at a neighbor's house and sent her daughter, Harley, to look for Gannon at a park. Letitia lied to investigators on multiple occasions, has unexplained abnormal behavior, such as obtaining a rental car, disconnecting her cell phone from the cellular network for an extended period of time, the false reporting of an alleged rape, abnormal patterns of travel, a continuously evolving story with material changes in facts and circumstances, and has since left the state of Colorado. These actions, when combined with the other facts, support totality of probable cause. The way they outline that is perfect because it is hard to put into words what we've heard, what Letitia has done and what we've heard from her. Right. Pretext calls and stuff. Yes. Very hard to, un yeah. It's very hard to adequately convey all that is her. Yeah. But this, the false reporting of an alleged rape, abnormal patterns of travel, a continuously evolving story with material changes in facts and circumstances. That is Bingo. Okay, now before I get into this section about his murder, I wanted to see, let me look at the comments and if there's anything you guys have to say or anything. Um, maybe somebody can tell Midwest Meemaw to come back in. Okay, Ava did, because uh, she says that we're muted. I hear us. I hear us too. Can I'm going to have to drop out and come back in. Okay. Confused by many on the stand during trial who said they didn't smell any strong cleaning products during the searches when all of them smelled strong ammonia and vinegar, especially in Gannon's room, per the docs. Hmm. Um, I think people frequently, um, what's the word I'm looking for, equate cleaning smells with bleach and i actually think that's really what they're talking about when they say they didn't detect a strong odor of cleaning product but there was definitely an odor and i i actually think that it's about you know but it's that it's the other stuff it's not the um you know it's the ammonia and that it's not like you know but i think i think they were expecting to to smell bleach right hey mel mel and kpm also has a point men can't smell anything <laughs> <laughs> hey 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 rachel oh um, okay so now we get into the murder of gannon stalk <clears throat> which is just oh breaks my heart Awful. even to say that phrase yeah i know i know <clears throat> The following section will outline what investigators have learned about Letitia's activity on the 27th and the, outline the period when Gannon was likely murdered. Um, investigators believe that Gannon was murdered by Letitia in the afternoon hours of January 27th at his residence and more specifically in his bedroom. Physical evidence recovered from the residence and inside Gannon's bedroom supports what a violent event occurred in his bedroom, which caused bloodshed, including blood spatter on the walls and enough blood loss to stain his mattress, soak through his carpet, the carpet pad, and stain the concrete below his bed. Some photographs of this evidence are included below, and I'll show you guys that. They're in black and white in this. Um, but let me just say one thing. I don't want to hear anybody come for me for the memes about Letitia after reading this. I don't give a shit about Letitia or her feelings. I'm not, we're not going to bully her for her looks or anything that she can't help. People are angry with her because of what she did, period. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say that, like, yeah, because there was only one or two comments with somebody was like, oh, wow, really? Well, yeah, it, it is what it is. Uh, everybody deals with things differently, but over here, I have no sympathy for this evil ass woman. I have none for her. So, right. Okay. Um, investigators believe 
wait, I just read that one. I'm sorry, you guys. Based on evidence recovered from the residence, Gannon's remains were eventually brought to through the house into the garage and likely loaded into the back of Letitia's Tiguan. After cleaning the murder scene, Letitia utilized the Tiguan to transport and dump Gannon's remains on the evening of January 28, 2020. Letitia likely disposed of his remains off Highway 105, South Perry Park Road in Douglas County. Indeed, the Metro Crime Laboratory determined that blood discovered in Gannon's bedroom, the stout garage, and blood on a piece of particle board located off Highway 105 all matched his DNA profile. So from the beginning, even without having Gannon, because they had all of this blood loss, they were able to come to the conclusion that he likely w was no longer living. Right. He, that the, the amount of blood loss was greater than someone could survive from without any medical intervention. Yeah. And since obviously um, once he went missing, you know, hospitals are, you know, they're included in all that stuff. You know, they get, um, Right. The same, you know, they get updates, they get pictures in case somebody, you know, drops a kid off or a kid comes stumbling in or, you know, a human, a person, but they get all of that stuff. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Poor Gannon. Peary. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> it is what it is. Oh, yeah. And you're exactly right. Poor Gannon. Because, oh just unfortunate but so on monday january 27th gannon stalk stayed home from school based on text messages from letitia to mr stalk gannon was up most of sunday evening with his stomach problem letitia did tell gannon school that gannon would be absent on monday investigators were able to verify that gannon was marked as an excused absence that day wow, wow. Um, excused yeah that's interesting they excused it just you, uh, um, just yeah yeah, usually you, well, usually you have to, what well, you have to send a note, like you can call, I don't know, that's how it is where I'm from, like you can call your children in, but then you still have to sign it, you still have to send a note the next day, we like do too. you have to write a note. And that and it, my kids' school, like even sometimes they don't excuse it with the parents write a note, um, sometimes it has to be a doctor's note. If it's more than three days. Uh, they you have for us you have to send you have to send a doctor's note okay yeah so that's interesting they excused it but um so Leticia also told Al that quote I'm just going to give them an excuse at work and stay with him unquote indeed Leticia did come up with an excuse and told her employer via text message that her stepdad was killed after being hit by a car and she would not be able to come to work that day other electronic evidence, such as time and date stamp photographs and videos, were recovered from her cellular telephone that indicate Gannon was likely still alive during the morning of January 27th. So first, now they're going to get into the photos of Gannon on his bed. Um, oh. God almighty, this is just I know. heartbreaking. Um, and they were going to show them, so just so you guys know. But uh, so as displayed in paragraph 54 below, images were taken on Letitia's cell phone at or about 8.13 and 8.17 on the morning of January 27th, showing Gannon sleeping in his bed. Of particular note, his Nintendo Switch is visible in the photo lying next to him on the bed. Mr. Stalk has said that his gaming system was of high importance to Gannon. To date, investigators have been unable to locate the switch. It should also be noted that Letitia used her phone the following day to conduct a Google search, Can Nintendo Find My Switch? This is also detailed in a list of some of her search history in paragraph 141 and reasonably occurred because she was contemplating how she would dispose of this switch. I conducted a Google search for the term can Nintendo find my switch and learned the switch does not come with any sort of tracking. As such, Letitia likely felt it was safe to dispose of the switch and use the missing switch to help deceive law enforcement into searching Gannon as a po searching for Gannon as a possible runaway. So let me pause there and say now, you know, as far as what we've learned at trial, we know they actually finally did find the switch. And you guys had a theory on how that got back to the house. Um, the other night, which was Letitia, but when did you think she brought it back? I know you guys agreed. I wondered if she brought it back 
see, they only checked them for the items they were bringing out of the house. They didn't check her for the items that she was bringing into the house. So I wondered if perhaps she snuck it into the house with her. Yep, I think that it, I agree with you. She had to have, oh my God, Crumb Curious fell off and she's back. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, if I had to guess, I would I would also guess that it was on Friday the 31st of January that she brought it back and, and uh, hid it behind the DVDs while she was getting her clothing and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, that switch was found by Albert uh, the day this probable cause affidavit was signed. So um, the house was sealed off as a crime scene from the 7th to the 27th. And this document is dated the 28th. Wow. That is so so this, yeah, so they found the they found the switch that same day that this document it. came out. I love those little details. Like, and especially that's why I wanted to do this because people look at this case with Koberger and they're like, they don't have this evidence or they don't have that. And it's like all they have is probable cause affidavit. That is nothing, you know, compared to what you know by the end of a trial. And those little details like you find out along the way like that are just interesting to me. Um, they also talk about the neighbor's surveillance camera that showed what investigators believed to be Letitia and an individual that appeared to be Gannon depart the residence in the Nissan Frontier around 1016 on January 27th. The video camera is several homes away and does not provide images clear enough to make positive identifications of those captured in the recording. The vehicle returned at or about 1419 and Letitia exited the vehicle. After viewing the vehicle, I cannot be sure if another person exited the vehicle or not, but I submit Gannon likely did return home with Letitia that afternoon, these times corroborated by data collected from ADT are discussed below in more detail. Now, this year, I remember when this came out and none of us following the case believed he came home. At this time, we didn't know about the evidence that was found in the bedroom. So all we knew was this recording that went out of Gannon leaving and he doesn't appear to come home which during the trial, I think I could see the shadow of him. I know I could. I saw the shadow on the when they made it big on the screen of him mm -hmm. getting home. But I, I know that, um, you know, this was a huge shock at the time. Yeah. Well, right, because it was just, it was hard to, um, it was hard to make sense out of, you know, why she went to Palmer Lake between Petco stops if that wasn't where he was actually killed. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. The whole thing doesn't make sense. Um, but also the fact of all the blood spatter and stuff in his room and the huge puddle of blood under the carpet. I yeah. Mean, I mean, all of the things that Letitia did, everything that, you know, that we find out is all very, 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 very problematic for her. Very. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Dova. So then they have, based on data returned from this ADT security system, the motion detectors in the living room or basement did not register any activity from 10, 12, 10 a.m. until 1422, which is 222. Investigators confirmed Lena to be at school and confirmed that Harley was at work. As such, investigators believed there was likely nobody else in the residence except Letitia and Gannon. Um, then they talk about cell phone information and her iPhone status and a text message sent to Harley from Gannon's phone that supports that talks about her leaving her phone at the Stalk residence the morning of the 27th. They say the fact Letitia left her phone at home is suspicious on its own based on her history of extensive use of the phone, which this kind of reminds me of that Brian Koberger putting it on airplane mode. Like they're not showing they're just showing like this suspicious behavior pointing out around the time of this crime occurring. You know what I mean? Right, right. I mean, she she was definitely um, doing everything and anything and everything that she could to um, evade capture. And I, I actually am curious. I've been thinking about this Apple Watch situation and how she used it, you know, and said, well, I didn't have my phone with me, but 
I had my Apple watch with me that should be able to track my movements. And yeah, I just, it's such an odd, it almost makes me wonder if she used somebody else's phone to see if, and to Google if they could download information from an iPhone or from an uh, Apple watch. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think you're, you are smart to look in the case file and even about that now though, if someone was to go missing, they would be able to. Use oh it. yes. Oh yes, they can. Interesting. Um, then they talk about her social media activity in between the days of January 25th and January 29th. Leticia spent 10 hours on Facebook and Facebook messenger alone. So over the span of those four days, 10 hours on face. So 96 hours, right? So it's four right. Days. That's crazy. That is 10% of her time in general is on Facebook. And she was very concerned about social media. Hell, look at her now. You know, she yes. still cares what people on social media think. Yeah. She's still doing, let's, yeah. Mm -hmm. She still cares. Yes. yes. A lot. Okay. Now, this is the point that th this is why they put that in there. Because on January 27th, after she comes home, she still does not even open her phone for 30 minutes after she arrives. So whenever she got home, she was doing, she was busy doing something. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. She sends the message to Harley's phone. Tisha left her phone at home. If you need her, text me at 1037 a.m. Then they talk about the Petco surveillance. Um, and Gannon not being visible on that surveillance. Her whereabouts are unknown between 1122 and 1222. No, wait, I'm sorry, 122. At 122, Letitia was again captured on video making a second purchase at the same Petco. Um, Mr. Stout sent a message to Gannon's phone at 1206 that read, Hey, buddy, this message was not answered until 121. The response said, can I play Zelda at least? Mr. Stalk replied, not today. So he was asking if he could play Zelda while he was laying in the back of the truck playing the Switch. Right, that exactly. <laughs> that makes no sense. And let's, None. so at 1322, she's captured at Petco. So right as soon as she pulls in the parking lot at 1321, she sends the message to Al about playing oh, wow. Zelda. Yeah, she was actually inside the store. Oh, okay. She Good. left her phone. She left Gannon's phone at Petco during the first Petco stop. And when she went back to Petco the second time, she retrieved Gannon's phone. And while she was still inside the store, she used Gannon's phone to send Albert a message that says, can I play Zelda at least? And then she checked out and then she went back to the truck. So that's how we know for sure that Gannon didn't send that message. Right. Because, I remember you saying that. Yeah, because she left his phone at Petco. So in that recording, because I haven't seen it, do you actually see her on the phone at that moment? Because it's interesting that they say that she's uh, she spotted on surveillance at 1322, but sends the message at 1321. It looks like they didn't know at first that she sent the message from in the store or what? They the didn't know that she had left Gannon's phone inside. They, they didn't, I guess they didn't realize that Gannon's phone was left inside the store. They must have thought, like I did just now, as soon as she pulled up, she sent it before she walks in or something like that. Um, right. Oh, my gosh. I forgot about her being seen in the pet code, sending the message. I need to Yeah, watch see, that. some of this stuff they didn't know until they got um, surveillance back. And when I was looking through, like, search warrants and stuff last night, um, I noticed that some of the stuff like they requested almost immediately, but they didn't get back for quite some time. Like some right. stuff that they had uh, requested at the, at the very beginning, like, you know, January 28th, 29th. Um, but they didn't get it until February. Some stuff just didn't, you know, it took them a while to come back. It took a while to come back. Well, yeah. and it kind of, um, they kind of alluded, you know, in the in the affidavit, you know, Gannon's phone sent the message, not Gannon sent the message. Right. Um, um, but then we find out at trial, Letitia sent the message using Gannon's phone. They just didn't word it that way in the affidavit. And then another example of that is back when they were talking about 
what they thought happened, um, you know, that eventually she moved his body through the house and put it in the Tiguan. Well, we all read that having only this document to work with and everything we had seen on social media and stuff. And we thought that the, that Gannon's body was in the Tiguan. But if you go back today and read the probable cause affidavit, it's very carefully worded. And and now we know that they actually believed he was in the storage room, but it doesn't say that in this document. And that's kind of, you know, along with the title and the reason we're doing this, this video tonight is the differences between, you know, the affidavit and what comes out at trial and the way they worded that with his body being eventually moved through the house and put in the Tiguan before she stored his body on the 28th. Now, after trial, we know exactly what they mean by that. But when we just have the affidavit, we only hear Tiguan. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, that is so, so it's, that's just a Yeah, it's just a perfect example of exactly what you guys are talking about with, you know, looking forward to the Coburger stuff, using yeah. this as an example. Intentionally leaving out details because they don't want to put it all out there at first. They 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 just want to put out enough to secure the warrant for probable cause. You know. Correct. Right. Um, by and the way, the thank you so much, Elena. I'm so sorry I missed your super sticker a few minutes ago, but um, uh -huh. thank you so much. And also, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for joining. Thank you, guys. But yeah, also, so like the phone in Petco is another example of that. I'm sorry, Jen. That's all right. Um, but it's just another example of that. You know, like Gannon's phone sent him the message. I, I think they probably, by then, by then they they would have had the surveillance footage and stuff. I mean... I feel like they just purposely worded it as Gannon phones sent the message rather than um, we know for a fact that Letitia used Gannon's phone to send that message because she was inside Petco and had the phone. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I, I, so the, the thing of it is, um, <sighs> yes, there are certain instances and this would be one of them where they can say things like we know for a fact who sent a message or who opened a phone because they have video surveillance to back that up. Right. Um, but most of the time they don't have that. And so all they can really say with certainty is that this phone was used at this time. And this is what, ha this is the activity that was on that phone usually. And what I wanted to point out to everyone is the burden of proof for a probable cause is significantly lower the bar is so low um in fact they could have stopped with what they have right here and it probably would have been enough to secure a warrant for her to get arrested for murder to be arrested and charged with murder it's very very low the the burden of proof when you go to a trial is much much higher and it, the burden of proof is always only and solely on the state and they have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, not beyond all doubt, but beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a, that's a high burden. It's not that high to get in, to get somebody arrested. It's not. Right. So when we're looking at this probable cause affidavit and we're saying um, we're seeing so much <clears throat> detail, although not as much detail as we learned in the trial, but significantly more detail than, say, Koberger's arrest affidavit or probable cause affidavit. The part, part of the reason Brian Koberger's arrest affidavit is the very bare minimum, just enough, is because <clears throat> they're usually public and they don't want to tip their hand. They do not want Brian to get ahead of the game or anybody that's that they because they're still investigating. They don't know if Brian is working on his own when they did that probable cause affidavit, right? They don't know if he's cahooting with somebody. So they want to make sure that they're not tipping anybody off also. Right. Exactly. Um, it is just, it's very interesting for me. I think the whole court process is interesting and it's especially like, okay, I, sometimes that's the only adjective that fits. <laughs> But it is fascinating and it really makes you think learning all these little details and, and the whole court process really is fascinating. Um, but it is. Okay. So the next part, they say a significant event occurred on Gannon's phone at or about 
1343, which is prior to arriving back at the house. There was an internet search for, can my parent find my cell phone if it's off? I submit that this internet search was likely conducted by Letitia on Gannon's phone and not Gannon himself based upon the content of the search, the way the search terms are phrased, and the presence of a period in between the phone and if. This is very similar to the way Letitia conducted searches on her phone. However, I located other internet searches with a period in Gannon's search history, which I also reasonably believe were conducted by Letitia. A more detailed explanation of her search history is included in paragraph 141. Well, I'm going to say this. I 100% agree with the writer, the author of this uh, probable cause affidavits assessment, because the fact of the matter is Letitia is, well, let, let's start here. First of all, we watched uh, Gannon come out of the house and he was staggering. He what he did look like something was off, okay? And um, kids don't do searches like that. They don't include searches like um, my parents, unless there's something very, in this kind of stuff. It's, right. to, it's so, uh, why would Gannon search, um, can my parents, what difference does it make? I mean, how it, all you really want to know is, can your phone be found if it's off? And the thing about it is, Gannon is at that age and he is born into a generation that is surrounded by technology. So this kind of learning how to search is, is they've learned it way younger than we did, you know, than my generation X would have learned it. Right. Because I remember back when, um, you had to, uh, hit the five, the number five twice. If you wanted to get to the M, the N, you know what I, I mean? mean? Yeah. <laughs> Texting was a pain in the butt. So must let much less searching and Google is way better now than it was way back when it first started as far as the search results you don't have to be as specific and it will almost guess what you're trying to figure out and kids know that it's the same way Letitia did with with that um why i suspect Letitia wrote the script for the videos that harley recorded but never uploaded what kid needs to remind people that they're a minor Oh, yeah, I agree with you. Yes, yes, yes. The ones that weren't uploaded because she said that over and over again. I'm yes. a, the minor thing was brought mm -hmm. up over and over. Well, actually, the, an interesting point about this parent they make next, they make next, which I'm surprised that they connect these dots on a on a probable cause affidavit. So they say, you know, he searches, can my parent find my phone if it's off? And look at the next one. Furthermore, the search term was parent. Singular. I submit right. it is reasonable that Mr. Stalk only, not Letitia, would be interested in the location of Gannon's phone and that Letitia was possibly deliberating on how or if she would dispose of his phone after she murdered him. Oh, I would have I'm, to agree. But it's crazy. They would connect those dots on a probable cause because that is kind of, you know, reaching a little bit. I mean, I agree with it and I believe they were, it was true, but. In a probable cause, I'm just surprised to see it connected like that. I but, think it's connected like that because um, they're showing that um, even though, and I think they have to connect it this way because both Al and Leticia would have presumably had access to Gannon's phone at various times. Obviously, when not when Al is in Oklahoma, but um, they have to tie it solely to her they're trying to close a window this is less about trying to this part here is less about trying to um um it's it's about getting the warrant but it's also about they're not being they're not being able to be a um an alternate suspect because look what's happening with delphi right huh that's kind of interesting um, if a police canine was there, Frisky, oh, my God. The first night, the first day. Midwest Meemaw wants me to read that part one more time. So let me. Okay. Furthermore, the search term was parent, 
singular. I submit it is reasonable that Mr. Stalk only, not Letitia, would be interested in the location of Gannon's phone and that Letitia was possibly deliberating on how or if she would dispose of the phone and after she murdered him. Um, they go on to say that they believe she did not get rid of the phone for fear it might be traceable based on the results that came up for that search. Um, the Nissan Frontier was searched. There was no blood inside. Um, Letitia had been without her cell phone for hours, yet her screen was not unlocked until approximately 1445, which was 25 minutes after arriving back at the residence. During that 25 minute period, there is motion activity both upstairs and downstairs. Um, Lana, Lana returned home at 1515. During the forensic interview, she said when she returned home, Letitia told her Gannon was asleep in bed. She could not see him. She told her to go outside and play. And she, they said, I submit that Lena was sent outside because Gannon was likely dead and Letitia was cleaning up blood from inside the house. At or about 1555, Mr. Stalk sent another message to Gannon that says, hey, buddy. And this message wasn't even read until 740 p.m. Based on exterior footage, Harley arrives home in her white Jetta at 4. Wait, 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 wait. The Hey Buddy was sent at what time? I think he sent that twice, if I'm not mistaken. But okay. this one was sent at 15.55. I but think not read until? 7.40. So it was sent at 3.55 and not read until 7.40. Which was after... Gannon was already reported missing. He was reported missing at seven. Right. Yep. Or right before seven, I should say. Because he was supposed to be home at seven. Let's see. Right? Am I remembering that time correctly? I don't uh, know. He was, he was supposed to be home at six. Six. And okay. she called 911 at 655. Okay. That's what yeah, I was. I remember her saying non -emergency. I know it's yeah, she, as I remember her saying, I know it's only seven. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. We have Harley arriving home. We have Letitia sending a text message to Harley requesting carpet cleaner, trash bags, and baking soda. These items were likely used to clean up the murder scene. Harley purchased these items and investigators located a receipt documenting the purchase. Harley Hunt has refused to speak with investigators. But they did verify she was at work. To be clear, investigators have not located any evidence that any person other than Lena and Letitia had access to Gannon between approximately 10 and 534 on January 27th. So now they talk about a review of a body-worn camera. So Jessica Bethel reviewed the body-worn camera of the officer is going to the home when Letitia reports Gannon missing. Letitia provided verbal consent for deputies to search the house. From the body-worn camera, I learned that the Tiguan, known to be leased and utilized by Letitia, was backed into the garage when the sheriff's office was at the residence. The position of the Tiguan in the garage is significant, specifically because of the confirmed presence of Gannon's blood in the garage below the area where the rear hatch of the Tiguan would be, and the positive reaction of Blue Star reagent indicating likely presence of blood on the rear bumper. Um he must have been bleeding a lot for just for it to get like through if if he was sitting in the storage room for a period of time and then you know we well. have in the bedroom we have some in the storage room and then you know all the way out to the through the house and into the garage right well, well but none inside the tiguan none in, yeah it's all on the outside so Huh. I'm going to have to think about that because I'm curious. Um, I won't ever request the crime scene photos. I don't need to see those. Um, I just, the whole situation just left an ick in my mouth. But I'd be curious as to what it looked like. If it was a drop or drops or if it was a smudge. Because remember, Leticia likely had blood on her. And so did she transfer Gannon's blood that was on her onto the back of that bumper? 
when she was trying to get that suitcase into the uh, take you on. Right. Um, Nola Chick, yes, the storage room was on body cam video. And I've got screenshots and like we're going to do uh, sometime a live going through like all of the screenshots, images and videos from the trial, just everything that's like in my file. And I know there are some screenshots I took of like the area and the where they believe that he was um, in a particular they have a particular bin that had blood on, in it that they believe that he was in for a, a, some waiting time i w yeah because she clearly changed her mind and had him in a i think she she changed her mind and had him in a bin and then decided on a suitcase maybe probably thinking that a suitcase would be easier for her to deal with than a bin a tote that makes sense. Yeah, because you could wheel it around and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to talk about the position of the beds. So they have um, images from his bedroom from the body worn camera and images from his bedroom from the photos that she took that day. Uh, image recovered from Letitia's phone after executing a search warrant that was applied for. These images both represent the condition of Gannon's bedroom on January 27th at or about 8.13 and just after 10 o'clock. This photo comparison is significant for many reasons. And the corner of the bedroom where Gannon's head is visible is the key area discussed in several sections below. So, A, the placement of Gannon's bed and... Um, they're so hard to see, but we will look at them in a second. But let me read through these two paragraphs. The placement of Gannon's bed is in the immediate location where his blood was found on the wall, the carpet, and on the concrete below the carpet. These details are discussed below, and a large volume of blood appears to have been in that area. B, for the purposes of comparison between the images, it appears that although the sheet may or may not be the same, the blankets are different and the pillowcase, if not the whole pillow, is different. I submit that a logical explanation for the missing bedding is that they likely were saturated in blood after Gannon's murder and were removed by Letitia to clean up the murder scene. Furthermore, investigators were unable to locate the bedding in the Stalk residence during any of approximately five searches of the residence, and we now know that his bedding was in the suitcase with him. So on the left, he has, you know, this top blanket that looks, you can tell that they're different, but it's still really hard to see, you know, the pictures at all. On the left is when the um, police were there. And on the right is the picture where we can see, we you can hardly see him, but little Gannon is in the bed in that picture. Um Another photo was recovered from her cell phone that shows his bed was not pushed directly against the wall by the head of the bed. This photo articulates the ability for blood to get onto the walls and floor in the corner of the bedroom. Mr. Stalk stated the positioning of the bed is unusual and the bed is usually pushed against the wall. So it was likely up against the wall during his attack. And then when after she cleaned under the bed and stuff, she didn't put it back all the way. I wonder why, though. What do you guys think? Here's the photo of him in bed, which in this photo is where you can hardly tell. But why do you think the positioning of the bed was different? I because think it was because she was trying to be a cool mom and she was going to let him have somebody spend the night Sunday night. So she pushed the beds together. I mean, God, what is your guys' problem? <laughs> Duh. Why are we attacking poor Letitia? She has been treated like a criminal throughout this whole process. Right. And I can't even believe we're sitting here having this discussion. Letitia wouldn't do anything like this. This is just a witch hunt. We're all barking up the wrong tree. I'm the tree, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you, Chris. I think that... She intended, I think things got out of hand for her. And I don't think she, um, I think she basically ran out of time. And I don't think she thought that anybody would notice it, to be quite honest with you. I don't think she thought it would be noticed. 
like, okay, so I think because if she was trying to like cover up the floor, she would have pushed it all the way back to the wall. Like she said, KPM right. says the, in the proof of life, it's not up against the wall. I think that it is. It's just hard to see in black and white. I can pull it in color and I might do that after if we have time. But yeah, I think Jen, you're, you're right. She just was lazy, didn't have time, didn't do it correctly and didn't think nothing about it. Um, yeah. But I do wonder like, um, it, I wonder if she even thought about it soaking through the, the carpet into the padding, into the cement and that kind of thing. Um, because she obviously took the whole entire piece of carpet out from the other room of whatever incident occurred in there. Um, and we know that, you know, she would be aware that there's, you know, foam under it than this. I don't know. I just wonder if she thought too much into that because surely the next person that moves in, you know, or if anybody decides to change the carpet, I just think that you, I don't know. I mean, at some point it was going to be found, but I think that Letitia thought that, um, that, that she was going to get away with it and that, you know, she'd be long gone. See, the thing of it is the, mo for her, the most important thing to do was to figure out what she was going to do with Gannon's body. Everything else she figured she would have some time to deal with. Like, of course, she would clean the main stuff up, but then, and come back and then detail it at some point. I think, but I think it got out of, con I think everything got out of control for her. That's, you know. Yeah, adrenaline and mania and all the things. Yeah, mixed together. I'll be right back. Um, you, as you can hear, Mac is displeased, so please hold. Okay. <clears throat> Didn't land and sleep on the bed until the wrap. So I don't know. I know that Al's parents, I believe, stayed down there. Landon, I'm not sure about that. It was uh, it was Albert's mom and his sister that were in Gannon's room on the two beds. Okay. Oh my God. That's so sad. Um. Now they're going to talk about number one. Al leaving, right? Okay, I'm not going to read word for word. We're just going to go through the most important parts. But um, they're going to talk about him leaving and returning and the, the vehicle that she rented. So he leaves on the 25th, but he spent the night in Denver. And he flew out on the 26th. Isn't that when he spends the night at the airport? Yeah, he spent the night at DIA on the 25th, Saturday night. And then he left... Uh, early in the morning on the 26th Sunday. Okay. And then he traveled to Dallas and ultimately to Oklahoma. On the morning of the 28th, Letitia rented a 2019 Kia Rio from a rent -a car in Colorado Springs and then picked up Al from the airport in Colorado Springs at or about 8.50 on January 28th, shortly after she rented the vehicle. They drove back to their house in this rented car. They say the timing of the rental is suspicious and combined with forensic evidence later obtained from the Tiguan and discussed below tends to place additional importance on why Letitia felt compelled to rent a vehicle that morning. Investigators located no evidence that the Tiguan was not mechanically functioning or noted any reason why it could have not been physically driven. Now, I do I'm wonder why they, I, I'm sorry. Um, I do wonder why they worded it that way because we know now, and, and they even tried to word it that way in trial, but the way Albert testified was like, no, she picked me up and then I waited for her while she rented the car. Um, but the way they worded it there, she rented the car and then picked him up. Um, Right. And I do, I do wonder why they did that. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, but you know me, I mean, I'm going to wonder. Yeah. That's a good thing though. I love that about you. Um, probably, I mean, yeah, I could guess, but I'll leave it. I'll just keep that to myself. But, um, Letitia provided statements to her husband. Okay. Wait, let me see. The T, yeah, that was the right paragraph. Letitia provided statements to her husband, Albert, that she was concerned about putting mileage on her Tiguan. That's what actually I was going to say just now, and I forgot. She did give the story that, you know, it was leased and had a mile, you know, so many miles, and they needed to search. <laughs> 
It is noted, however, during that time of the Kia rental, Letitia only put about 71 miles on the vehicle. During the time period Letitia had the Kia, she would not provide the location of the Tiguan, and Mr. Stalk never saw the Tiguan. For example, she told Mr. Stalk the Tiguan was near French Elementary School. We know now that that is one of the things that had Al's um made red flag stand up for Al because he drove by the elementary school and didn't see the car. Yep. And that's when he said, I'm going back for a second. I got some stuff. Off, I got to get off my chest. Yeah. He, you could tell he was shook in that bit in that, in that interview. Investigators did take a swab from a stain that was confirmed in the trunk. Oh, God, I can't even remember from the trial. I should have got my notes of all the DNA stuff, uh, where all the DNA oh, yeah. was found, because I don't want to be inaccurate about it. Um, so let me just, we're going to go to this part. Okay, the Volkswagen Tiguan is important to investigators because because I don't want to compare what they put in the affidavit to the trial without having the exact exact which I do have in my notes um, and I should have gotten. But um, there's so much more to go through. Anyways, we'll just move along and come back to it another time if we want to. Okay. Okay. Um, so the Tiguan is important to investigators because they believe the Tiguan was used to transport the remains of Gannon from the Stalk residence to a location where Gannon's body was dumped. The definitive locations of the Tiguan are unknown to investigators during the time period of approximately 702 on January 28th and midnight on January 29th. Investigators believe, or 1,200 hours on January 29th. Investigators believe Letitia dumped Gannon's remains on the evening of January 28th and utilized the Tiguan to do so. The Tiguan was seized from Letitia on January 29th. She had an interview on January 29th. When she arrived, she was, now we heard about this in trial too. When she arrived, she was driving the Tiguan. Investigators noticed the vehicle was wet and appeared to have been recently cleaned. I submit that Letitia had to clean the vehicle because there was likely visible blood on the rear end based on the below luminol reactions. Indeed, video footage was recovered that shows partial view of a car wash in Colorado Springs where the, they captured the back of a or a portion of the black SUV consistent with the Tiguan at or about 11.30 on the 29th at the car wash. It's consistent with data obtained from the Tiguan's computer system. Let's see. To be clear, luminol is a chemical to trace blood. Several areas of the Tiguan reacted to luminol. Specifically, the search team found evidence of suspected blood on the rear bumper and step plate of the rear bumper. The location of the blood is significant because this vehicle was backed into the garage at Letitia's residence the day of Gannon's murder. The search of the residence is discussed below, but it is noted that evidence of Gannon's blood was also located on the floor of the garage, consistent with where the rear end of the Tiguan would have been. So this photo below is going to demonstrate, and you can't see anything on it really, um, you know, the glow from the luminol on the Tiguan, but it, where it's black and white, it's very hard to see. Inside the Tiguan, a receipt from the dollar store was located with trash bags, baking soda, and vinegar. They do believe Harley purchased these items. Also included in the dollar store purchase was baby oil, baby lotion, cotton rounds, bubble gum, um, they have no meaning in this. Let's see. She knows personally that baking soda and vinegar are common household items that can be used to clean blood. Now, I've heard that too. My Actually, my whole life, like that's one of those old wives tales, you know, because the baking soda will bubble it out. And it's yes. all, and also peroxide is one. Yes. But you can't so, use peroxide on stuff with colors. Because it'll bleach it. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. While the purchase of these items are common and in no way, le no sense illegal, um, the timing of these of the purchase of these items is suspicious. 
um, and beyond coincidental. There we go. Let me see here. There's <clears throat> a lot, so I didn't want to read it word for word. I just wanted to capture like the most important parts because we are going to have discussions around it, you know. But yes. if anybody does want to go back and look word for word on Curious Jen's website under the Stalk under case files, you'll have like five different cases and I think five and Stalk is one of them. And um, there is so much information. You can find this under that tab. OK, so now we have her January 29th interview and the report of the alleged rape. Um. She has the interview with Jessica Bethel, which is just, oh my God. Her statements are reasonably categorized as untruthful, incomplete, and misleading. The uh, interview was supposed to start at 10. She did not arrive until noon. Investigators provided food and water to Letitia during the interview. Of interest, Letitia brought several pieces of notebook paper with her that contained notes she had written down. During the interview, I'm she sorry. referred to these pieces of paper and asked investigators if she could just read her notes. Investigators were not able to seize these documents. I have conducted hundreds of interviews on subjects, victims, and witnesses. It is extremely rare for an individual to bring notes to an interview. Is it? <laughs> um, Letitia drastically departed from her initial statements given to the sheriff's office. She says she was held at gunpoint and raped by an Hispanic male known as Eduardo. And that Gannon was abducted by that male after he finished raping her. The interviewing detectives believed her statements were false based on prior experience investigating SA cases. Let's see. So Let's here's see. something to think about real quick. This probable cause affidavit was leaked by Sharif Farsfeet on April 2nd of 2020. Harley saw this probable cause affidavit and this was the first time when Harley saw this affidavit. You know, her mom's already in jail. This is the first Harley is hearing about Eduardo and the alleged rape. If you're Harley and your mom's in jail and you're reading this document and she left out, you know, this initial story that she told police about her being raped and, and, and then you put it together that the day after she told you the, the day after she told police that she was raped, that's when you guys get accosted by the by the mean the mean horrible police at the Marshall's department store. I mean, if you're Harley, I mean, I get it. She's a little ditzy. She's young, but I just, I mean, can you? I just, um, I don't know. I think it's interesting to think about it from that perspective, because until this probable cause affidavit was leaked, Harley had no idea about the Aguardo story. Well, you know, that is super interesting to think about, but I can just hear Letitia telling Harley, just like she told Al. I, I mean, do you think I wanted to tell you about that? Do you think I wanted to tell my own daughter about the assault, about being assaulted by a man? Or you know, I don't want to, I don't want, you're going to re-traumatize me again? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, let me see here. So they go through her story, or you know, she, what she told on the 29th about you know Eduardo and her essay and um, all of that, and um, they make the point that you know she cleaned up the scene and she refused the SANE exam, and um, so they believe she did clean up as. S but it wasn't an essay. It was a murder scene. Then yeah. I'm going to talk about the ADT data. So let me see. Well, basically, as one of their points is that it doesn't uh, line up with her story. <laughs> Imagine that. Shock. Uh, I'm shocked. During her statements, Letitia did deny killing Gannon and provided explanations as to why there was blood in her Tiguan, 
blood in Gannon's room and why she was in the area of Palmer Lake, Colorado. See, she does that. We've watched her, and that is one of the things that is just, like, fascinating in a bad way, that she, um, as things develop, she will change the story to fit whatever evidence has has came out, you know? Mm-hmm. So Letitia was then transported to a local hospital in Colorado Springs because they're talking about her 29th interview. Letitia was transported to the hospital via an ambulance from the sheriff's office for further medical attention. Letitia was accompanied by detectives. Unlike questions by the sheriff's office, by paramedics during the ambulance ride, Letitia was unresponsive to questions by medical personnel and seemed to have a miraculous recovery when they arrived at the hospital. Oh, this is when she, yeah, you guys know when we've watched this in Jen's roast, uh, her <laughs> <laughs> interview. This is you know, when I she was trying to avoid that. going to the hospital because yeah. she didn't want to cause a scene, yet... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Letitia continued evasive behavior at the hospital, but particularly after investigators told her they were going to detain her pending the issuance of a search warrant to collect her DNA. Ultimately, the search warrant for the collection of non-testimonial evidence was signed and executed. A second warrant for the compelled SANE exam was initially authorized by this court, but then was quashed by the court. To be clear, Letitia did not allow a SANE exam to be completed. Letitia was not in custody after the warrant was executed at the hospital and left the hospital without telling investigators. She also made a phone call from the waiting room at the hospital. There was physical surveillance being conducted by law enforcement in the area and investigators learned Letitia was picked up by an unknown person at the hospital and reunited with her daughter several miles from the hospital. Now, don't we know, wasn't Harley with her friend when she picked her up? Or am I wrong there? Uh, hold on, let the, me think. What's the friend's yeah, name? Harley was driving and Janine Sanchez was in the passenger seat. Yeah, yeah. Miss right. Sanchez. So I wonder, wonder why it was written like that at this time, reunited with her several miles from the hospital. No relation to Maria. Well, <laughs> no, but they, see, that's the thing is they didn't actually, they, there was some confusion because the way it, the way it came out was... Letitia made a phone call. See, it, there's mixed stories. It's just like that damn rental car at the airport. Um, so one way that uh, I can't remember exactly where it came out this way, um, but I remember seeing that Letitia got a ride from a stranger from the hospital to a Taco Bell. And then Harley and Janine picked Letitia up from the Taco Bell. I think that was, oh, I have to go back and look and see, that's why I have to know every time, like when I get the information where it comes from, because in the trial, when they had Janine Sanchez on the stand, I, I think they made it sound like, um, like they picked her up from the hospital. But when Harley was on the stand, that's when we heard about Taco Bell. Uh, so in order for me to go back to it and find out exactly where I got that information, I would have to look at both Harley's testimony and Janine's. Um, but in one, in one version of the story, they picked her up at Taco Bell. She had gotten a ride from a stranger away from the hospital. And that's when she was reunited with them. And then in the other version, when Janine was on the stand, they made it sound like they picked her up from the hospital. And so I was confused by that, but it did come out both ways at trial. But like I said, in order for me to know exactly what I'm talking about here, I'd have to listen to Harley's and Janine's again, because I know the difference in stories comes from those two testimonies. But according to the affidavit, she was reunited with her daughter, you know, a few blocks away, which was actually at a Taco Bell. It just doesn't say Taco Bell. Um, and then we know that the phone call that she made, one of the phone calls that she made from the hospital, she called uh, her sister, Amy Lowry. Okay, interesting. And by the way, I've missed a couple things. I want to say thank you so much to Sexy Wild Thing, Carol Freaking Calls. There you are. Many people have been asking about you. Yes, um, I'm many people. 
<laughs> yes, Jen's one of many people for sure. Irving Babbitt, thank you so much. That is really sweet. I appreciate that. And check this out, you guys. Freaking StreamYard. I can see that Carol Claus gifted a lot of memberships. Thank you so much, by the way. StreamYard is now showing me gifted memberships. What? Yes. That is so cool. Thank you, Carol freaking Claus. And, and thank you, Irving Babbitt. Thank you, guys. That is so awesome. Yay. And it stars them, so you can't miss them. Oh. That is so sad. And I wanted... I want. I'm sorry. I wanted to say too that uh, she had told the nurse that her daughter was out in the waiting room, and she wanted her daughter to come in to be part of the sane exam because she didn't want to do it alone, and she wanted her daughter to be there for it. Um, but Harley was not actually there. She just used that as an excuse to leave, and that's how she. That's how she ended up going out the door. Was Which by is telling funny them, because Harley did show up at the hospital. Asking for her, but yeah, because of where she, because of where she was to protect the privacy of the of others, Harley wasn't going to be let back there. It is, Lynn. Awesome. She also tried to make. It also appears that Letitia made a phone call from one of the hospital phones, like down in the ER waiting room, and um, <clears throat> the. Um, the cop, the officer, hit redial. And it was to Harley, and then there was another one that was, I can't remember now, that was in the... Uh, the case report. Yeah, case report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Amy Lowry. Um, Artemis, Art, Artemisia, I hope I said that somewhat correct, said, I've been rewatching all of the interviews and the trial. I've caught so much that I missed. And I noticed that when we were going through the trial, because I watched intently. I mean, maybe occasionally, like I would have to be around my family. So I would, might would be watching and something would happen and I wouldn't hear part or, or something like that. But for the most part, I was sitting there with a notebook, notebook taking notes. And when we would have the discussions afterwards, I would still hear things that I missed from you guys and from Melissa Jade and, you know, pe other people we were talking to. So I am sure going back, you probably do catch a lot that you miss. It's just like watching a movie for like the second time, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, listen to this statement they write. Although her behavior was not illegal, I submit that as pressure continued to increase from investigators, Letitia became more and more desperate to leave the hospital, likely because she feared being caught in her lies. Furthermore, Letitia did not want to pursue collecting evidence that might assist law enforcement in identifying and finding her supposed rapist. I would agree with that, yes. Um, and just for a little side note thing, I think tomorrow night I'm going to be doing a live with my friend Amber, ATS News. I just seen her in the chat um, about the new about some calls that were released with Chris Watts and his family. And I think that will be fun. So and if you guys haven't checked out Amber's channel, definitely check it out. She has an awesome channel. And yeah, she covers some of the same cases that I cover as well. And the girls on panel channel is always being dropped in the chat, but they are also in the description box. And um, when any awesome channels come in here, the mods drop their links. Like, nay. <laughs> um, thank you guys for being here, by the way. Okay. Let's see. Now they get into the discovery of blood in Gannon's room. So investigators searched the, the residence several times over several weeks after applying for and being granted search warrants from this court. The purpose was to collect evidence, including biological evidence, in support of the captioned investigation. Not all of the evidence recovered is included below. However, the forensic testing results of several items, including a pair of Nike shoes, are discussed in paragraph 126. Gannon's remaining family members were living in the residence during the period of these searches, and investigators did not initially seal the residence off. Crime scene analysts from Colorado Springs Metro Crime Lab responded to the residence and found traces of blood throughout the residence based on Blue Star Forensic Latent Bloodstain Reagent Test. There was visible blood in Gannon's room in the garage and other portions of the house. 
Blue Star Forensic Stain has similar limitations to Luminol, which has been described and discussed above. Let me see here. They go into the background of the house and, you know, the, okay, so the Blue Star was applied to Gannon's room, the hallway leading to the utility room from his bedroom, the utility room, the staircase, and the landing leading upstairs from the utility room, the pathway to the garage from the stairs, and the garage area itself. In all of these areas, investigators found positive results for the likely presence of blood. Mm. I have a photo, but you can't see anything in it, so... Um, so this blue star, you know, leads them to the corner of Gannon's bedroom where they suspect blood had seeped through the carpet. So let me just read it. Furthermore, there was also blood stain and projected blood spatter located on the walls in this area. Indeed, over 50 droplets of suspected blood were found on the walls near Gannon's bed. Crime scene investigators also suspected someone attempted to clean the walls based on the way the Blue Star reagent reacted to the wall. Gannon's mattress was also seized and contains a red stain consistent with blood in the same area as the stain on the carpet and the blood cast off of the walls. The stains on the mattress were swapped but were not tested with Blue Star. The laboratory results have not yet been returned, but because other blood in the area was determined to be Gannon's, investigators suspect the blood on the mattress is also Gannon's blood. So they did not have all the results back, and that's going to happen. I think Jen mentioned it earlier, but it's going to happen with, you know, every case. They they won't have all the results back. Some of these No, they will not. Mm -mm. Sometimes don't they take like six months? I mean, it depends on how backed up the lab is, what exactly they want done, how many things they want tested. It just takes time. Yeah, it takes time. Those are pictures of the blood stains on his mattress. And also you have to remember that not only does it take time, but the crime lab is still, I mean, there are other crimes coming in. You know, so they're investigating crimes that came in prior there and they're, you know, are also at the same time, you know, and yeah. Um, based on the orientation of Gannon's bed, the vast majority of the blood would be in line with the position of his head and torso. I submit the blood lo located in his room appears to have been cleaned up based on residual blood residue on the baseboards and electrical outlet cover and the blood that soaked through the carpet. DNA laboratory testing has confirmed it was indeed Gannon's blood and Gannon's body has not been found, reasonably indicating this was likely the scene of Gannon's murder. So he had not been found, but, you know, that's a lot of blood. So yeah. they use that to determine um they did have mr griffin a tom griffin who is an international um association for identification certified senior crime scene analyst a blood spain pattern analyst and a crime scene reconstructionist mr griffin examined the blood spatter on gannon's walls he preliminary reported the stains on the walls are consistent with one or more blood spatter producing events, which could include gunshot, blunt force trauma, or a stabbing. My God, they probably never imagined freaking typing this, that it was all three. Gunshot, right. Blunt force and it. Ugh. Right. To have that in the probable cause affidavit and then to know how they found his body, you know, That's just crazy. under three weeks later. Right. Yeah. Um, Mr. Griffin did not believe the blood stains were aspirated blood, primarily due to the lack of air bubbles in the stains. Furthermore, the shape of the stains were affected by the surface texture of the drywall itself. Trace evidence swabs of suspected blood were obtained from the electrical socket next to Gannon's blood, and it was determined it was indeed Gannon's blood from DNA testing at the time of this affidavit. The electrical socket also has evidence of streak marks, which are reasonably suspected to be from Letitia's attempted cleaning. The presence of this stain tends to support that there was enough blood around the outlet covers to seep around its edges, leaving a visible outline. So they found when they removed the outlet cover, a visible red stain was present outlining the edges of the outlet cover. So they were able to determine there was so much blood 
that, you know, there would have to be a lot of blood for that to, to be that way. Yes. She's such an evil, evil person. And people want to get mad because I we want to laugh at some memes making fun of her stupid ass and all the dumb ass lies she tried to tell to cover this up. Hell right. no. Right. Um, so there we have, and we've seen this in, you know, color now. And and we'll look at some more images of, of this stuff that we got from the trial whenever we go through that. Um It'll be a, a few days, though, because they're going to do some other things over here. And we're waiting on a batch of things from the courthouse and or, or from, yeah, and all the things. Not the courthouse, but from the county. All the things. Um, I've also included a photograph of the suspected blood stain in the concrete. I will never forget when this came out. Like, this just, oh, my God, it was so disturbing to, to hear this. So, um just like reading it all reminds me of when I first heard it. I know. So blood stain in the concrete located in the corner of the bedroom where Gannon's bed was positioned. This stain is also visible in the photo depicting the suspected blood spatter on the walls. The carpet above this stain in the concrete was clean and investigators suspect Letitia cleaned the area based on on carpet fibers, on scrub brushes, the acquisition of carpet cleaning supplies, vinegar, and baking soda. See, this was a new construction build, and the Stalk family was the only family to reside in this residence. And I know Curious Jen has told us that before. You can see it better on this photo. So there is the concrete, and you can see the huge dark stain that soaked through. I'm surprised she was able to get the carpet clean completely. I am too. It's kind of crazy. Look, there's your uh, pinche. Oh, Be pinche. <laughs> pinche, Becky. Oh, Elena. Appreciate you guys. She's a monster and she won't ever answer Al when he asks about all the blood. Can you imagine being a parent and your baby's missing and you find all this? I'm telling blood? you, they yeah. see, the thing is, is Isis Al, I think, knew that she, during all of those pretext calls, because, okay, um, I don't know if you were on the panel, Allie, or you had to um, dip for a second or whatever, but um, when I went back and was like looking through the case, uh, reports to see what all was going on around the time of these pretext calls, like right before, all during, and then maybe after. They were getting the stuff back from their subpoenas of the of their financial records, like their banking institution, what well, you know, their debit cards. But Letitia had a debit card mailed to herself. Where did she have it mailed to? Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Not only that, but she was making purchases on that debit card that is attached to Al. <laughs> and so, like, at, at any point in time, Al could have been just checking, you know, logging into the banking app and been like, oh, hey, what you doing? You know what I mean? Yeah. So they knew for a long time that her bitch ass was no longer in, uh, nor in 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 Colorado. Yeah, she was at a nail salon in South Carolina. Yeah, and at Zaxby's too, by the way. Yeah. Riddler, thank you so much for being a member for eleven months. I can't believe it's almost been a year. Wow. It's a long time. Yeah, you. And you know what, Jen? Thank you for bringing that up because that just made me put it together. You know how she's whining about how they don't have any food and they don't have a place to stay. Well, they yes. had a place to stay and they had a food and they, they had a food. Oh, you guys, I'm tired. Um, but she's, she's getting her nails done. Yes. You're, you're telling Got me you don't have food done. and right. Come on. Got her so, and I will say this next time, you, you know, pay attention to this ladies, because when you're arrested and you're wearing flippy floppies, um, and they, br and they bring you into the interrogation room and it's very close quarters. Your feet are going to be very prominent. And Leticia, I don't know, you might've had your nails did, but your feet look like you snatch your nails from large bodies of water, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good priorities. 
Oh, bye, Riddler. And I hope you and mom have a great night. And thank you for being here. Yeah. Bye, so that Riddler. made me put it together when she was guilting Albert that she didn't have money for food. But we have proof that she was actually getting her nails done like that same day. Um, and then that makes me think about the crappy text or uh, Google searches she made. Remember about Landon getting her nails done and, and yes. how that made her a shitty mom? Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. You know, something about your your nails being more important than your kids or something along those lines. Yes. Yeah. She Googled yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Sure did. And the fake Polly was like $300, Ashley said. Christina made a point about her not looking up at all, but then watching when they show the crime scene or the autopsy, which I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But let me ask you guys, and I know this is graphic, but I just, I wonder, does this just based on, I wonder about her actions after, um, he was deceased or after all this blood, you know, he, it, whether he was deceased or nearly deceased, um, he must have laid there for a while, right? For it to go through the mattress, down into the carpet, down in, in that much of it too? Oh, I don't know. I mean, remember there were 18 sharp force injuries. That's true. So it would be fast probably, but ugh, it's just, yeah, awful. It's awful. So this is the concrete um, again. Let me see. <sighs> then they recovered a piece of carpet from the utility room. Remember, they found a couple pieces of carpet. And you guys that are new here uh, didn't know, but it was actually Teresa when we were watching the trial that made us all realize that she replaced that carpet twice. And in that photo that she yes. sent with the wax on the carpet, it had already been replaced once. So she replaced that carpet and then what it, you know, poured the wax and all that and then replaced it again. And they found the big piece of carpet and then that square of carpet. Um, but in the pictures that she showed that were out at the time, you can clearly see the line where it was a new square of carpet in the dirty old tan carpet. So they found that they found the carpet in the utility room. They found in the dishwasher carpet brushes with the carpet fibers in them. They located an empty vinegar container. Um, let me see. Metro Crime Laboratory report. So this is where they go through, you know, DNA taken from the shoes, the garage, the um, in summary, Gannon's DNA profile was found from blood samples taken in the garage on the outside of size eight and a half Nike shoes and in Gannon's bedroom. Letitia's DNA was recovered from the interior of the Nike shoes. I submit to the court that the lab results tend to corroborate the theory that Gannon was indeed murdered in his bedroom, brought into the garage, and his remains loaded into the Tiguan, subsequently to be disposed of in an unknown location. So they have carpet in the uh, carpet found inside a carpet roll in the utility room with blood on it, a mixture of three contributors. At least one is male. A DNA profile was not suitable for comparison. Like I said, I kind of don't think we should. I don't want to go through this DNA without my the results from trial. I agree. Okay. They go through historical cell site location. And, and you know, this is something that I've tried to say as far as Koberger is concerned. They can do much more with your phone than see what tower it hit off of. The FBI cast team is incredible, and they can, they can do much more than that. Yes. Um, let's see. The historical cell site analysis identified unusual activity for Letitia, including potentially disconnecting her cell phone from the network for several hours. I submit by disconnecting her phone, she intended to prevent law enforcement from being able to determine her location. Specifically, this occurred on January 28th during the evening she disposed of Gannon's remains. Then they talk about her cell phone. And some text that she has with this babysitter. Let me see. 
Letitia made statements to investigators via text message that could be considered exculpatory in nature related to the presence of blood in the basement of their residence, as seen in the below text message. I have talked with investigators that were inside the residence on the 27th, 28th, and 29th. There was no odor of smoke and no evidence of smoke. In fact, one detective noted the basement smelled like coconut and was very pleasant. Furthermore, I know that burns oftentimes do not produce wounds that bleed profusely. So her message to explain the blood says, When we came back inside from the smoke, there was blood on both of us. I didn't know what to do. I was scared I would get fussed out fussed out about it and I didn't know if he should go to the doctor. I kept trying to add the candle thing but Albert kept saying it was small and minor. I was sacred and the basement was smoky. Went through the covers on everything we both had blood. I was sacred. I'm sorry, sacred. That's typo. <laughs> instead of say instead of scared. Come on, Leticia, aren't you aren't you a doctor? Yeah. Don't you don't you proofread your work? No. Never. <laughs> Here is her message to Harley, which we saw an incredible timeline with all of their movements, messages, and everything in order in the trial I, that was so well done. I remember saying, like, I wish we could get this file to go through after, just to go through their timeline, because they did such, it was just so well done. Um, carpet powders, two things, baking soda and trash bags. That's her text to Harley. Letitia's internet activity. Now, this is kind of interesting. Between January 25th and January 29th, she was able to review some, possibly not all, of the stored internet search history. And if you guys haven't seen, Curious Jen has videos on a lot of this stuff. Read you to sleep uh, with her text messages, Google searches, all that stuff. So you definitely want to check out her YouTube channel. They're also on her um, website. And then, of course, Jen, I know, has lots of great videos going through the trial. I mean, she's Oh, I, I was at something else, not at you. I'm working on um, something for you guys. Sorry. And I, I moved something when I didn't mean to move something. My bad. Mm. Hey, Bridget. <laughs> so okay. I had a moment. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Let's see. Between the dates of the 25th and the 28th, Letitia viewed websites associated with searching for a job in other states other than Colorado, such as L.A., California, Orlando, Florida, Pensacola Beach, Florida, and Fort Lauderdale. Now, Florida's close to you, Letitia. She, additionally, she visited a moving cost calculator website. Do you remember in the call when she says 95? And then Al's like, mm -hmm. wait, 95? And she's like, I mean... And she changes it, and I was like, "Be careful! There, you're going to have the FBI looking all over the East Coast." Yes, her heart yes. probably dropped in that moment. Yeah, it probably did. She she had a, she her only comeback to that was anger. Yeah, she, that's so. right. At, shortly after that, she got she got loud again. So she, they do include some search history in here about her being frustrated about her position as the stepmom and that kind of thing. Um, she says, I also direct the court's attention, attention to the way Letitia's search terms are sometimes entered. Letitia hits the period instead of the space key multiple times while searching. So that, remember, they think that message on Gannon's phone was her because of that at this time as well. Let me see if there's any I want to bring up. Um, if you aren't involved in your kid's life, you are shitty. My husband's ex-wife does nothing for her lids. I wonder if my husband's ex-wife is sending me a card since I raise her kids over and over. One day, some people will wish they treated you differently. Not Find today. Yeah, listen, to find a guy who I will never forget these, but it's still funny reading through them. Like, are you serious? Find a guy. You search this in damn Google. Any of this shit. Is it your personal journal? Find a guy who right. wants to take care of his kids and get paid. Or how about this one? You put this Look. in Google. What does Google say to it's crappy? Some parents don't care for their kids or buy them presents. What does Google return to that? I'm going to look that up right now. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, let's Read see. it to me. It's. It's crappy. crappy. Some parents don't okay. care for their kids or buy them presents. 
she made sure she was the she made sure she was the one raising those kids then to complain about it Grr. i'm gonna google some of those oh wait i typoed by megan i'm not sure about that i've wondered that myself did she think that she was the suitcase would make it to the water i i don't know okay let me tell you what uh comes up from quark from cora cora some parents don't spend much time with their child, but instead give the child gifts as a way to show their love. Do you think this is good enough? And then there's votes. No, this is not good enough. Absolutely not. You tell me. Yeah. What in the world? <laughs> yeah. She probably wondered why she was getting Tupperware ads because she was typing lids. <laughs> not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, they ha people also search for parents that don't care about their child quotes. Oh, my God. Why do you guys think she made these searches? Now, this I've always wondered, and I'm sure we've talked about it, and I've just forgotten exactly what you guys thought. But she these couple searches. Will humidifier help if exposed to smoke? Smoke effects will humidifier help. Smoke from fire effects will humidifier help. And my son burned the carpet. How do I fix it? She's so ridiculous. So let's look here, though. The Based on the time, okay, this is all in the middle of the night. The only ones that are around the time that Gannon, what happened? Wait a minute. Let me see. Are there any? Uh, 126, 127 a.m., 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 and then 127 p.m. At 654, she Googles El Paso Sheriff's Office number. Her last search on the 27th was, like that night, was at 4 a.m., 440 a.m., and that was for Suede Repair LDT for Sofa. No, Kit. I think I just read that. Yeah, it's just a little blurry because of the text. They are asking for our son's toothbrush but said nothing is wrong. Why do you guys think she searched about the smoke, though, if there was no fire at all? Maybe for what she could say that she... She used to alleviate the smell. Okay, that makes sense. She could tell officers, it doesn't smell like smoke in here because I did... Right. Yada, 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 for lack of a better word. <laughs> what? Yada, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure with Curious Jen's okay. She, she was quiet, Curious so Jen, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I never know what to say when you guys um, talk about there not being a fire. No, I think that there was some sort of a fire. Okay. What I'm saying is, I don't think it was quite, it was the event that she's saying that it was. Meaning, I don't think that she, uh, that, that the fire was so bad that she needed to throw blankets on Gannon and stomp, stomp it out. That's yeah. what I'm trying to tell you. What yeah, I'm trying to say is that the level, the way that she talks about this dadgum at fire was as if she says Gannon was on fire. Okay, there's no other way to take that. And I don't believe that at all. It's not that I don't think there was a fire. It's that I don't think the fire was how she says it. And yeah, yeah I don't think there, that's me too. Actually, I don't even know if if she just like took a torch and burned stuff. I'm, I'm, I know there was some things melted and burned. She could have I'm lit just, a, a lighter for all I we know. Don't, yeah, I don't think that like the the basement was filled with smoke. No, I don't either. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't think it was this huge ass event that she's trying to make it out to be. Because I'm telling you that if, again, if if she said what happened had happened the way that she said it happened, when there would not be an amount, opening windows would not be enough. Especially well, hair and skin. Have, have I mean... <clears throat> I'm trying to remember exactly where the burn marks were. I remember the wax on the carpet and the floor. And I remember like a little bit of the burn marks on the carpet, but weren't there some on the couch as well? Or So that couch is like suede. 
but it's not like, oh my, this is going to sound, it's not good suede. Okay. And so it's one of those, uh, uh, it's like an ultra suede. So when you, when you sit on it, if you scooch, you will have a dark spot, right? You can, you can, you know what I mean? So from the pictures, some of the pictures it's unless I think the ones, obviously the ones that were shown in court are of poorer quality, but the ones that actually came in the case file are very good quality, obviously. And so, but if you just read the case reports, the way that they describe what was on the couch is a pour, not a splatter. You know what I mean? Yeah. They found it odd. And so what I think is that um, I think she tried to stage it as if there were a fire, this huge fire. But what she ended up doing was just going around and burning shit. Honestly, I don't think were, it was what she said it was. Were, okay, were some of the blankets burnt? And then also Slick Nicky makes a point about the ADT system and the fire. And I think they talked about that in court as well. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back and watch because I know there was a lot of her saying that the ADT was yelling fire, fire. But here's the thing. If that alarm was going off and yelling fire, fire, why wasn't nine, why weren't, fi why wasn't the fire department dispatched? There's, you know, how does that, how does her system work? That's what I want to know. I think she drugged him, tried to burn him, had to jump on him. He's so little and he drug disoriented it and she. Written and then she records him. What do you think, Curious Jen? About yeah, what do you think? I think Gannon is the one that put out the fire, but I think that he was drugged, and she didn't expect him to put it out. And I think that she started it, but that's just you know that's just what I think. I don't have any proof. Right, but do you think there was like smoke, like house full of smoke, kind of fire, or just? I think she couldn't tell the truth if she was paid to, and we know how she likes that money. Right. Mm. Yeah, and you know what, Ashley? I've watched experiments, and we've talked about doing some, but when you have a lit candle like that that's turned over, it goes out. Like, the wax puts it out. So Yeah, the only way to control the wax not putting it out is if you're the one pouring it. Elizabeth, if you are, and that's and Alex asked me the other day. Alex, like I, now I'm using your government name. Allie <laughs> asked me the other day what I thought the sock was for, and I'm going to tell you what I think that sock was for. I think that sock was for her to hold the hot ass candle like a pot holder. That's what I think she used it for when she poured that wax. That wax was poured, yeah, not splattered. Um, Elizabeth, during the medical examiner's testimony, they said, you know, it would basically be impossible to tell because he was at a, um, a level of decomposition where they wouldn't have been able to say for certain. I saw there was one that you had up, I think, right before that one uh, where the person wanted to know why, you know, why, why would she start a fire? Mm -hmm. And and in order to make sense of that, you have to go back to the staged burglaries and the false sexual harassment claims and the faked knife incident and the faked pregnancies. And it's all attention getting and, and games with her husband. That's why she would set the fire. He did something that she didn't want him to do and she wanted him home. Yeah, she was, she was big mad that prior to his leaving, they were celebrating Lena's birthday, right? Wasn't it Lena's? Yes. And um, the, her, his mom was there. And Albert, which things have to be pretty bad in your home if you voluntarily go sleep at the airport. Yeah. She was mad about that. She was mad he was going anyways, but the whole weekend was not about her and you Letitia and Letitia's we're all in Letitia's world. You know, it's Letitia's world. We're all just living in it by her grace. Well, to your and, point here, look at the search messages all about yeah, that, you know? Yeah. And so, and I do think that fundamentally Letitia is a very possessive and jealous woman. And quite frankly, 
I think that she would have seen evidence of Al cheating that where none existed, to be honest with you. So it's from, I think she always just suspected Al. I don't think she trusted him, period, at all. And I think that um, she did it just like what Jen said, to get attention. She wanted him to come home. But she also, I think there was a secondary part to that. I also think she wanted to prove to Al that Gannon was dangerous. That he right. set that that yeah. he set that on fire. That he is he's dangerous. Right, which is why I. What's one of the reasons why I've always questioned whether she actually wanted to kill him on Sunday with that fire. Um, I think she just wanted to get him in trouble. I think she wanted to be the hero. I. I mean, I don't know that, um, but it's one of those questions you know that we've tossed around a million times, and I think that if it was her intention to kill Gannon on Sunday and have this big, you know, tragic event that makes Albert come home and, and allows them to trauma bond. Um, I feel like she gets more out of continuing down the road where Gannon's in trouble because Letitia needs a bad guy. Yeah. So, and, and then simultaneously she rescues him from this fire that he set. They're right. trying to endanger them all. So then she gets to be right that he's a danger. She gets the attention and she's the hero. Right. Absolutely. Because there's right. part, I got to say this one thing before I forget, because there's a part in that call on the 17th or it might've been the 19th <clears throat> where he says to Letitia, you can be the star. You can be the star repeatedly. And at no time, does she ever say, I don't want to be the star that like to somebody who doesn't actually want to be the star or doesn't want it to be about them. That's freaking offensive. And that should have yeah. gotten her hair up, but it didn't. That's a yeah. good one. That is offensive. Um, Jacob says, why come Letitia mad is because Al didn't want to hit it before he left. <laughs> and then look, she says, sent my husband sexual messages and he ignores them. See, kind of like her. Prove to me you're prove to me you're alone and tell me my favorite position. And you could I mean, I can see Albert, hear Albert, feel Albert wiggling, squirming, like I don't want to fucking answer this question. Right. I just wish he would have said second place. <laughs> I had an even snarkier comment. You didn't get to hear it. I said when he finally did respond with from behind. I wish she would have said Landon like that's Landon's too, just because she constantly is talking shit about Landon. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Yes, yeah, that she would have flipped, but the goal was to keep her from flipping and get as much mm -hmm. as they wanted. They knew she wasn't going to tell the truth, but, and they said this at the trial, but they, it's so interesting that they kept her talking because they wanted those little slips. They wanted, they knew little bits of truth came out and they were able to figure out based on what they already had, the little slips she had, you know what I mean? They were able to narrow things down a little bit um, mm -hmm. with what happened. Okay. So LA, so LA Sauber sober says, and this is exactly my thought when curious Jen gave her theory the other day, she probably drugged Gannon. So he so she could burn him alive, but he woke up and put the fire out. He was drugged up. So he believed he accidentally started the fire spilling candle, which is why in that recording, he was like confused and sorry and crying and apologizing because he was kind of out of it and believed he did it. If he was asleep, you know, that would make so much sense. Oh, um, her new boyfriend, George Glass, is it all the time? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I wish Wolfie was here uh, for that one. Some deleted Internet searches located. OK, so these were deleted ones and these were not deleted ones. Um, my husband only cleans up for the army, not for me. My husband never posts about me, but he does from everything else. Are there any free money to move away from a bad situation? <laughs> oh, my God, Letitia, you are so, ugh. ugh. She's the worst. <laughs> yes. Letitia's consciousness of guilt. 
this is kind of interesting. During the first 24 to 48 hours surrounding the disappearance of a child, it is reasonable that an assumingly innocent parent or step parent would be contributing to search efforts and fully participating in the effort to recover the child. In the 24 to 48 hours surrounding Gannon's disappearance, Letitia rented a vehicle, turned her cell phone off for approximately four hours on the 28th, washed her Tiguan immediately prior to coming to the sheriff's office, evaded law enforcement's attempts to conduct a more in-depth interview, and did not participate in the search for Gannon. On Tuesday, January 28th, between 848 and 854, she instructed Harley to Pull your car in the garage via text message, presumably to temporarily cover up any potential evidence left behind. To be clear, Harley has her own vehicle that was mentioned above in paragraph 13, a Volkswagen Jetta. Um, then she they talk about her messages to Al, and she says, and she also does, okay, so at 619, she does a search in her internet browser of they are asking for our son's toothbrush, but said nothing is wrong. At or about 1631 and six, so 431 and 433, she has a conversation with Al via text. She says something isn't right. I think they're hiding something. <laughs> And Al says, who, the police? Letitia, yes, they asked for toothbrushes. Al, hmm, what do you think they're hiding? Also, on that day, she made a statement to investigators. Um, what do you want from me? Because I have nothing. One of your very own leaked to me what you guys were doing. And I got a point about this in a second. One of your very own leaked to me what you guys were doing. I did nothing and am or being set up. I'm not really even sure other than other that being told that by another blue with El Paso. I was told I couldn't go home to sleep. And on top of that, men were sent to a home with a minor female and she was forced to stay there, not to even leave for food. Every conversation that said, even at this moment, I can hear inside. What do you want from me? Number one, Letitia, that sounds a lot like the message you sent me about one of my very own sending you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but number two, somebody pointed that out as well in the comments. But she obviously has to be talking to somebody to know it was put on members only and know that it's even called that. But still, I think that's interesting that it sounds like so similar to what she said to us. Um, every conversation at this moment I can hear inside. Detective Bethelson says back, come in and talk to me. I would just like information to find Gannon. So then they they give their theory. They believe she rented a Nissan Altima, which this is the one that, let me see. This is the one that Brenda rented, right? Or was this the one that, yeah, because hers was a Kia something. Rio. Yeah. Okay. So they believe that she utilized the rented Nissan Altima to return to the area in which she disposed of Gannon's body. Indeed, investigators recovered a piece of particle board from this area with Gannon's blood on it. So then they do a little map and then, you know, talk about her GPS. They talk about the data they recovered from the Tiguan. Um, let me see, because I don't want to go through word for word. It's, it's a lot. Then we have the continued evolution of her stories. Investigators conducted several consensually monitored telephone calls with Al. Pretext calls, you guys. So I just want to see what they say about that here. Specifically, Mr. Stalk, at the direction of law enforcement, communicated with Letitia via telephone and email. These communications have been recorded and memorialized and consisted of hours of recorded conversation. I will not provide a transcription of these calls, but I will summarize the importance of particular changes in her story. For the purposes of refreshing the court, here is a summary of some of her statements, whether to law enforcement directly through the media or to Al in recorded email and voice communications. So on the 27th, she said he left to play at a friend's house, did not come home, come home at six like he was supposed to. On the 29th, she stated she was held at gunpoint, raped, and Gannon was abducted by her rapist. 
Within Letitia's falsehoods, there are details corroborated by physical evidence that would be near impossible to know without being intimately involved in the murder. Letitia has made statements to explain blood on the walls in Gannon's bedroom, blood on the rear bumper of the Tiguan, blood in the garage of the Stalk residence. Details of the location of blood evidence has not been released to the media nor to Letitia and has been closely held throughout this investigation. Furthermore, Letitia has continued to provide alibis for her physical locations not previously disclosed to investigators. The majority of the conversations between them began around February 13th. Over several days, her story continued to change. During a phone call on February 13th, Letitia stated that Gannon was burned by a candle to the point that his skin bubbled and that Gannon peeled the burns off and wiped blood on his bedroom wall. Mr. Stout did not ask about blood on the walls of his room during this call. The fact she provided information about blood on the wall likely indicates her knowledge of the murder scene. On February 14th, she had another conversation with him and gave four additional versions. We have story one. When El Paso came to the house January 27th, the abductor was still in the residence. She tried to signal to deputies there was someone in the residence. It should be noted that deputies checked the entirety of the house and no additional person was located. Story number two, she was raped by Quincy Brown at her residence and Brown abducted Gannon. She knew Brown's identity because she saw a paper of, and his identification card fall out of his pocket that had his name on it. Letitia sent a photograph of Quincy to Al via text. He was, um, and he mirrored, the photograph mirrored images online wherein Quincy was listed as a most wanted suspect discussed below. Story number three, Quincy Brown followed her from Petco and at some point was laying in the middle of the road in front of her car. When Letitia stopped to avoid running the man over, he jumped into her car and made her take him home, then raped her. Story number four, Letitia and Gannon were near Car County Line Road, Highway 105. Um, Gannon was riding a bicycle in the area and fell off, hit his head, and was then abducted by Quincy Brown. In this version of events, Quincy Brown was driven by a man named Terrence. The February 14th story Terrence. number four has several interesting considerations. During the period of February 12th through the 14th, it was public knowledge by virtue of media coverage that investigators were searching for Gannon near Highway 105 in Douglas County. Letitia brought this location up on her own without a prompt during a conversation and provided an alibi for why she was in that area. Letitia was adamant that investigators' efforts to search for Gannon in that area would be futile. This area turned out to be significant based on the Tiguan's location on January 28th and that Gannon's blood was found in this area. Furthermore, Letitia drove through the same area in her Altima rental on January 31st. I submit that based on raw data re retrieved from the Tiguan, Letitia was likely in this area on the evening of the 28th and Gannon's remains were dumped in the vicinity of that area. Letitia's story lays the foundation for a reason why investigators may locate Gannon's body with head trauma. On February 15th, she provided additional conflicting stories to Al, including that the story she told Albert about Gannon falling off the bike was a lie because it was what she believed he wanted to hear. She yes, stated because that's what people want to hear. Yeah. That's something that, that Al would want to hear, Letitia. That makes total and complete sense. I was wrong. You're, you are you you are very, very smart and logical, and I completely underestimated you, my bad. <laughs> um, Letitia stated the blood in the corner of Gannon's room was a combination of hers and Gannon's on this 15th call in this explanation. She stated the abductor anally penetrated both her and Gannon with an object. Additionally, she was tied up at some point point in the abduction and the abductor was still present during the El Paso Sheriff's Office visit that night. Then they go on about Quincy Brown. Quincy Brown was listed on the most wanted list on February 10th. He was put on the list on the 10th and she was using him as an excuse by the damn 15th. Um, okay, let's see. Gannon's blood is located in Douglas County on February 15th. 
They, so they were searching there because of her location history and the Tiguan on January 28th. The particular location was deemed important based on raw data from the Tiguan and location data from the rental on the 31st. On February 15th, searchers located a piece of particle board during that search. The particle board had a stain that appeared to be consistent with blood and is pictured below. I have added a red circle to indicate the location of the stain. Um, it does match Gannon as well, which we can't really see it in this. And the in the court photos are, are not black and white. Um, this area is rural. It is likely populated by wildlife. Gannon's remains have not been located. And while investigators will continue to search the area, it is possible the remains have since been scattered. Now, you went out there um, in your car, right? Curious, Jen? <laughs> She's off the fell off the panel. I don't know if she's backstage oh, or not. She is. Damn it! I was not. <laughs> yeah, I can't see anything when I'm reading. <clears throat> yeah, I went out there several times. And um, oh my god, I just can't imagine being there in person. Just because when I went to the couple crime scene, like, well, I went to the place where Lyric and Devin were found, but I also went to Summer house and both of them being there in person it's so different than seeing it on video and it's such a like you feel it in your bones you know what i mean is that how you felt yeah yeah there there were some there were some moments up there that um i mean i know we've talked about it felt yeah. like a spiritual experience Formerly fossil, I feel, in my opinion, whatever she did on Sunday left a mark or marks on him that could not be explained away, and that's why she killed him. Yeah. Or maybe she was worried that, uh, you know, he would tell, too, like, whatever she did or that he, you know, was a witness to, which I think was he was a witness to something that happened to him. But I'm just saying, you know, people have different theories surrounding that as well. All stories are ridiculous, even rewards, screaming for immunity, gang, gambling. I know. I cannot, I can't believe that she ever thought that this would be, she would be successful at getting away with this. And she took it all the way to, tr think about it. This is damn ridiculous when the arrest affidavit was written before he was even found, much less to the point where three years later, she still took it to trial and and, and used every defense she could up until the end of I did it and I wasn't aware I was doing it. <laughs> right. It's crazy. Oh, She's Stephanie, crazy. I'm so glad you found us, too. Oops. Let me see if there's anything else that I want to point out. Is there anything else you guys wanted to mention or touch on? Not that I can think of right off the top of my head. Well, I mean, just back to, you know, like the reason, you know, the reason you wanted to look at this um, and comparing it to what comes out at trial, you know, it, it listed here four versions of the story. And we know that there were a lot more versions than the ones that they listed. But imagine if they would have added cash belly pregnant lady. And I went into Petco the second time and came back and he had disappeared from the vehicle. And I mean, what else did she leave out? What were the four that that's, I that's right. When I lost internet connection, oh, okay. when you started those four. Yeah. And then before we'll touch on the polygraph too, cause that's at the end of this, but let me go back. Okay. Let's see. We got, I think it was for that one day. And then, yeah, we have the first story that, um, you know, whatever she told Alan and, and Landon initially, but then on the 14th, she added four additional versions, which was the abductor was still in the house when the sheriff's office was there that she was raped by Quincy Brown and Brown abducted again. And from the residence, she saw his identity when a paper fell out of his pocket. Um, number three was he followed her from Petco. And number four was he was riding his bike and fell off and, and he was um, taken by Quincy after that. And this doesn't explain that he was taken by Quincy to get bandages and all of that stuff, which we heard at trial and we heard, it right. you know, 
Right. So if this was four, and then the other one she told was Eduardo, which she told during the police interview on the 29th. And then the one before that is that he was missing. So there's six, but um, we can we can add at least two more because we've got Cash Belly Pregnant Lady with the money laundering. And then also he just vanished from out of the car because she left him in the car the second time to Petco. Yes, and the one that she gave Crime Online, that Al and that other guy. Edgar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. This woman. <clears throat> yeah, so there's at least nine versions right there. And I don't think that that's mental illness creating the different versions. I, th I think it's no. Yeah. 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 I don't think, I don't think that it's, uh, yeah, I do think that Letitia has a mental illness that I will agree with, but I don't think that that's why any of this happened. Right. I completely agree. I'm just scrolling back for a minute, looking for P Patricia's comments previous comments but there's it's taking me a second to get back I swear I think there's more stories than even those though even right. my goodness Patricia hey Tim Green Letitia said Gannon caused the candle fire by knocking it over but also said that Gannon was asleep when she went down there she even said Gannon was on fire while yeah didn't she say she jumped on him there it is yes Patricia which I believe, like we've talked about before, that was just to explain away some sort of injury that was on Gannon that could be explained away from jumping on him. Right. Which is where the busted nose and busted lip come in, which she let slip is the real reason why he didn't go to school on Monday. Yeah. Um, okay, so Patricia says, a narcissist's worst fear is to be revealed. And Gannon was getting older, and he ain't stupid. He was onto her deceptions, and she was afraid he was going to tell Al, so he had to go. Was there yeah, a point? I agree. I... Wait, go ahead. I want you to respond to that. Yeah. Oh, no, I just, I, I agree. I think that's a huge reason. I mean, Gannon was absolutely the target, and she had been working on it for a while. I mean, when I say target, I mean like the next target. Letitia always has to have a bad guy. Right. And it was just Gannon's turn. Yeah, it could have been any of them, really. Um, I, 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 the way she's talked about Lena and Gannon being her favorite. Go ahead, Jen. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, th there's something... I don't know. I, I always, there, there's some, for some reason for, for uh, Letitia, well, I think there's a few reasons, but Gannon was definitely the target. She, she definitely targeted him over everybody else, you know, which is so sad. It is sad. Letitia doesn't seem to feel any remorse for anything she did to him. I want immunity. I need immunity. I could jump through this phone and slap her. I know. Who asked for immunity? Oh, God. Oh, my Lord. To help. You know, she 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 asked for a lot to help. Like when she asked for her passport, she needs her passport so she can help find Gannon. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Imagine if they would have put in the Google searches about the face transplant and the cartels and masking the IP addresses. And I mean, because they had all that by then, but. Yes. Katie. Yeah, but they didn't need it. No, but it just, I mean, imagine if all that was out. But, you know, that's that's the thing is the difference between the affidavit and the trial. There's Correct. just so much more. Yeah, I mean, the pr the burden of proof, um, you know, that's why I, I would caution people when you, you know, don't, I would keep an eye on it. Listen, mistakes do happen. Guil innocent people are charged and convicted. That does happen. But what I would say about that is it's too soon right now in Koberger to, for me, in my opinion, 
to say that because we haven't been presented with hardly anything. Yeah. And the probable cause is not the end all be all. That's, I mean, that's just what they need to get an arrest. That doesn't mean that that's all they have. Um, I, okay. So this channel I used to watch all the time when his case first started. I don't think that they still are doing anything now, but I'm going to share the link with you guys in a second, just in case, but that they had, when the picture first leaked or whatever, this is where it's coming up for me to originally, which, you know, it, they came out at trial too, but can you guys see it? Not yet. I'm looking on the TV, not on my phone. So yeah, it is I can. close to the wall, you know, not touching it, but. Right. Which actually kind of makes sense because you would want to be able to put the comforter for it to be able to hang in between the bed and the wall. Poor baby. I know. I just See, I know everybody thinks that that is the suitcase, but looking at it like this, I kind of don't think that's what it is. Because in those calls, didn't Letitia talk about going into Gannon's room and bring it, putting a bunch of blankets in there? I'm actually wondering if that's like a wad, a wad of blankets. It could be a wad of blankets. It kind of looks like that. Thank you, Debbie. Um, <laughs> excuse me. They also had that wedge. I know that I've t we talked about that before as well. There was a wedge on that picture, or I mean, on that video that she put out of Gannon where he's worried about his burns. Um, Lena is laying on um, Al and Letitia's bed, and she's laying on one of those wedges. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it doesn't, it looks more like a wad of blankets in that picture than a wedge, though, to me, now that you mm -hmm. say that. But I've always well, I'm thinking, thinking, well, you know again, these are, these are things that, that we saw before the trial. Remember, right? This, yeah. And, right? Yeah. Because my mind is just blank right now. I don't know what my problem is, but these are things that we saw prior yes. to the trial. Yeah. But now first. hearing, yeah, but now hearing the, the pretext calls where she does talk about this. And she does say she brought a bunch of, because she left all the windows downstairs or, you know, open downstairs, which let me just ask about that. She's so worried about somebody breaking in and telling Lena that somebody's watching out of her, you know, watching into her window, but she leaves every single b window to the basement open. Yeah, I to the people who think that it's a suitcase, um, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I was sitting in the aisle the day that they carried the suitcase through the courtroom. And I was literally two feet away from the suitcase. And that suitcase is bigger than you think. And it's just, that's, I just, that's not, that suitcase is a lot bigger than what I see in that photograph. I just, I can't go with the people who say it's the suitcase. I think that there is a specific uh, angle of, of the photograph, the way that it is um, zoomed in and cropped because it's zoomed in that make people think that it is but when it's zoomed out like this and you see the picture the way that it was taken originally that's it, it doesn't look anything like um anything solid like a like a suitcase like that or even a wedge it looks like blankets yeah um i love this picture of gannon Aww. look at him there it's like kindergarten or something you know he's so little what a um, little button april i believe that was in the 13th call was it was that the call that that was in you guys about the nose yes. and the last yes. one that we listened to yes oh, let me see what's in the private chat oh, okay no no <laughs> oh no. Okay. So, um, let me see. Smooth criminal is on my head since you barely sang two words from it an hour ago. I'm sorry, Jessica. Um, 
All right. Jen, Jen Lu's intro, uh, Jen Lu's intro has uh, stayed with me for an entire day before. Well, Nay, <laughs> Nay made me, um, Nay I'm said it in one time in the chat, in the chat, I'm a frog, I'm a frog, I'm a lion. And ever since then, when it gets to that, I'm a fraud, I'm a fraud, I'm a liar. Now I sing when it's on. You guys can't hear me because my mic is needed. But I'm like, I'm a frog. I'm a frog. I'm a lion. I'm a frog. I'm a frog. I'm a lion. <laughs> yeah. they said, I'm, a fraud, I'm a fraud. Call me liar. Or that's I'm what a, I it's I it's inner. One verse is I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud. I'm a liar. I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud. Call me a liar. There's two different verses. It's yeah. But whatever, I, nay broke me. So anybody that that's, uh, wants to know what's wrong with me today, I'll be blaming nay D. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, nay. I was about to say Latisha. <laughs> Thanks, <about> nay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so before we go, this is the end of the affidavit, and I think it is definitely worth mentioning. And I mean, after going through this many pages. Um Letitia attempted to obtain fake polygraph results. On February 18th, at or about 1014, Letitia called 321-247-6876. I conducted research on that phone number and learned it was associated with fakepolygraph.com. During that call, Letitia stated she never got a confirmation for a test she paid for. Letitia provided the spelling of her name, and before disconnecting the call, the unknown male stated he would resend her the results to her email. Now, Jen played this yesterday. Um, so yes. if you guys missed her live last night with um, Curious Jen, they played this call, which, oh my God, if you haven't heard it, you got to hear it because she's, yeah, she's just insane. But here they quote part of it. So the unknown names, the unknown male stated that her report was blocked by management based on the content of the questions and stated that with any illegal activities, they reserved the right to not send the report. Letitia's response was the following. What do you do now? Just delete it and go on about life and keep the money? And the male says, yes, we do indeed. And she said, okay, I got you. Thank you. Bye. This is how much we get in the affidavit. And in court, you get to hear the entire call, which there's much more to it about infidelity and all kinds of stuff. And that shows you how they just put a little snippet of something in the affidavit. And then at trial, you get to see the full picture. Correct. Um, and I just can't get over all the times that we've heard Letitia now explaining away this affidavit to her friends and family. You know, she talks about it like it's 98% cheap trash. And and it's what is it? Twenty eight pages, thirty two pages. Uh, probably twenty eight of stuff. Um, but know. listen, if it was three pages and it included fakepolygraph.com, dot com, it would be enough. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's like very problem. Like Letitia, I mean, of all the places that you could go, fake polygraph. That's the one you chose. Which that, in my opinion. That's desperation. She she could not go in and take a polygraph like at a police station administered by a uh, by law enforcement. No, no, no. And <laughs> she couldn't she could she could not take a legitimate lie detector. That's just facts. L Letitia um, is a lot of things, but. <sighs> I don't think that she I don't think she's the the kind of evil that can that can pass a polygraph test. See, part of passing the polygraph test is you have to believe the shit that comes out of your mouth. And so you don't you have to believe you're telling the truth. That's or be really hard. Completely psychotic or you know, where you have no Well, yeah, and yeah, or hopped up on like Xanax, yeah. A ton of benzos. But here's the trick. You got to have enough benzos to keep your heart rate and your respirations low, but you can't waltz in there looking, you know, acting like you toe up from the flow up. Like when you have that, um, the benzo tongue, which is like yeah. um, a cow tongue and a human mouth, like it's really fat and thick and mm -hmm. um, you don't talk right. 
yeah, there's a there's a difference between a drunk slur and a pill slur. And right, it's, a, it's a fine line. You can't be, you know, and she'll something walk tells in there. me she don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. She, oh, no, sorry. Uh, she'll walk in there and they'll say, is your birthday August 3rd or August 4th, 1983? And she'll say 35. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my exactly. God. Exactly. Um, PJ Becky, Becky, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. I appreciate oh, that. Oh, welcome, PJ Becky. <laughs> and um, formerly Becky. Fossil, Woofy would appreciate that. She also loves Zelda, and um, he was an amazing big brother. He was so caring. This kid was so compassionate. He was sitting there worried about, you know, the safety and well-being of his siblings and I, just stuff that kids, I mean, worried about this memory box for his potential son one day. These are things that a lot of little kids might be told by their parents, but they don't hang on to and care about like he did. He was so special, just all heart. He worried you know? all heart. He worried a lot about and was concerned a lot about other people. Yes. And absolutely. that level of, he had an extraordinary amount of empathy. He Absolutely. didn't, he just was not your, he just, I think he stood in the empathy line twice because um, he you yes. know, just did not want to hurt anybody and was worried about how, uh, how other people felt, which is, inter which is actually breaks my heart more for even more for Gannon now that I am really thinking about it because of who the kind of person Letitia is. And she would have, he would have. I, I, I just feel like he would have done anything to please her yeah. and tried really hard and I really yes. couldn't figure out, oh. bless this little heart, why he couldn't get it right. What and wrong? why yeah. exactly. And it had nothing to do with him and everything to do with her because that's the kind of person she is. That makes Ugh. me so sad because I guarantee I know. you that was the way it was just hearing about the other things about him. You guys, I, Cheryl makes a really great point. Like if she would have planned this from the get go, because we know there's speculation based on life insurance policies, based on some of her searches and, you know, earlier on than the 27th, 25th, even, you know, sooner. Cheryl says, you know, they all went hiking the day before. How many accidents slash murders have happened hiking? And oh my God, they slipped and fell. Al possibly oh, would yeah. have believed that. He and probably would have. Oh, thank you, sexy wild thing, Carol freaking Claus. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, before we go, because this is the end, but there are a couple of the questions that she provided fake polygraph, and I want to read those to you guys. So there was, um, do you intend to answer these questions regarding your stepson truthfully? Yes. Is your birthday August 4th, 1983? Yes. Did you participate in any way in causing harm to your stepson? No. Did your stepson return with you to your home? Yes. And did you participate in any way in causing the death of your stepson? No. And this was to fake polygraph. This was before he was said to be dead. This is, you remember, we've talked about this so many times that he had not been found. And she was, yeah. and, and any time Al even hinted at the fact that Gannon may no longer be living, remember, she lost her freaking yes. mind which he did oh, I know, I and but maybe that's why she added it here but it's still interesting that that was one of the questions yeah but if okay but here's the thing think about it logically she's the one coming up with the questions right why would she come up if she doesn't want to entertain death why bring up death yeah that's true i think this is what happens when you don't sleep but 32 minutes in 30 days well, but she was she was saying from the beginning that the reason she was doing the polygraph was so that Albert would believe her and so that she could clear her name in the news, you know, because she was going to release it to Crime Online and they were going to vet it. And so if it's for Albert and Albert keeps bringing up that he thinks Gannon is dead, then this is her trying to squash that. Mm, I don't know. Just weird. Okay. In conclusion, 
uh, it says, I think, I think this is interesting, based on data collected by the FBI and reported in the Journal of Forensic Sciences, I learned that in over 71% of homicide cases that involve false reporting, the reporting party is responsible for the murder. Um, to be clear, this statistic is not being provided as this, you know, for probable cause, they put this in here, but just an additional fact. They said um, they believe she's unhappily married. Letitia has not provided a truthful statement to investigators at any point during this investigation, particularly regarding the circumstances of Gannon's disappearance. Um, initially, he was playing with a friend. All of the changes in the story, she was unable to provide a logical reasons reason why she rented the vehicle, the presence of all the blood, the blood in the bedroom, um, the blood that was found out on Highway 105, her travels out on Highway 105. Um, let's see, the explanations that she gave that she wasn't prompted for, like why blood would be found on his bedroom wall, mm -hmm. um, the, the cell phone tower data, video surveillance, um, and that is why they've gotten the search warrant. Letitia was the last person to see Gannon alive. Investigators have not located Gannon's remains at this point in time, although the search continues. As additional time increases without locating Gannon, the more likely it is that Gannon is not alive. Based on the facts said above, I submit probable cause exists to believe that on January 27th, in the state of Colorado, Letitia committed the offenses to include the first degree murder, child under 12, position of trust, child abuse resulting in death, tampering with the deceased human body, and tampering with physical evidence. The There's irony of all of this is that had she shut the fuck up, they would have had a very difficult case without a body. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I mean, you could you could get all the, the blood evidence together, but it's that, in co it, it, if they could have been successful, let's say, I'm glad that they did, but let's say they didn't. Let's say this trial had proceeded without Gannon's body being recovered. <clears throat> they probably would have, they would have gotten a conviction because of all of the things that she did. All the statements that she made, those pretext calls, all of that stuff, going into the police department and coming up with that cockamamie story about Eduardo. And then he turned into, um, Quincy, and then he was Quinn Guardo, who uh, took a bunch of empty boxes and Gannon. Do you know what I mean? Like it was, yes. you know, but it, had she not done, had she not done the fake polygraph and all this stuff, like, I don't think, you know, those pretext calls. Oh, they were huge. Yeah, They were huge because, yeah, they had that really shaky, crappy, um, nonsensical interrogation that they gave her interview. Because it wasn't really an interrogation. There, it was mainly her talking. So it was her interview. And it was shaky. And it, it was very nonsensical and rambling. But if Al, ha I, I really think that if they had not recovered Gannon's bodies, those, those pretext calls would have been even more uh, important. And I think they probably would have played a lot more of them in court. Well, you know what? Those pretext calls are the perfect thing to lead up to this affidavit because that is how they got the warrant for her arrest. That is a huge part of how of the evidence they had against her to arrest her without Gannon, without finding Gannon. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? All those, like you said, her run, all the stories that her talking, you know, and but it's the way that we did it, playing the calls and then doing this, it ended up mm -hmm. absolutely perfect. And then and think about it. Like she bolted. She was, she, she did. She wasn't even in Colorado and yes. hadn't even talked to Al for like two weeks. Right. But then he reaches out to her. And I think when I listen to that one from uh, the 13th, she's, I hate to use this word, but this is the only word I know how to describe. She sounds giddy to be talking to him again as if, she really believes if she goes through this bullshit story and goes through all these notes, et cetera, et cetera, that she's going to be able to convince him and get him to take her to take her back, even though, excuse me, even though she didn't actually even want to be back with him. Yeah. Well, but, um, yeah. 
I, I mean, n but not only did she never even look for Ganon, she was working on her defense before anybody even knew he was missing. I mean, yes, it, she was always working on her defense. Remember when she was telling people about the polygraph, when she was getting the fake polygraph before she was denied or it was blocked by management? Uh, she was talking about how that was was going to work with the jury. Yes, like you haven't even been arrested yet, and you're already talking about how this how this polygraph can't be, you know. Uh, oh my God! But she is always it's going to rip everything to shreds. Right, but she was always coming coming from a place of the defendant. I mean, before anyone even accused her, she was so yeah. defensive. I think that's what that video is about too. Um, yeah. Giovanna, thank you for becoming a member. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. I really do. Um, also, if you guys didn't see my community post, um, I was say like there is, and I've mentioned it a couple times during this live, the meme contest. It is, you know, only about Letitia cannot be about like any of the anybody else everyone else is a victim of that bitch i'm sorry um but and excuse my language but that is just the truth but the winner i'm gonna give a 30 dollar amazon gift card and yeah i just thought it would be a fun way to make have a night that wasn't so it's a lot of tough stuff we talk about that can be really tough and it can be tough on our hearts and our minds even when we leave here in our dreams and you know when we're brushing our teeth in the morning i don't after you've been like touched by a case like this and after you look at it so closely and you see the photos of everything that you know it's it's hard to get it out of your mind jen was just talking about it earlier like getting the candle out of your mind it's it's hard so and it's just tough stuff so i thought it would be a nice way to just ha hang out and um laugh a little bit and relax that kind of thing so if you want to join that if you want to send in send one in just send it to my email which is on the banner at the bottom of the screen Okay. Is there a deadline? Um, well, I think I said that we would do it like on the around, like, cause we don't get paid until the 23rd. So that's when I'll do the Amazon card. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess not, <laughs> but try to do it within the next couple of days. Cause I want to do it, you know, before the 23rd, but it's only the 11th. So that gives like, let's give it like a week. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and um, this mail mail, your comment was perfect. She said, oh, my gosh, I meant to save it. But it said something like Gannon was highly sensitive. But come what comes along with that is noticing noticing like subtle changes or someone's subtleties. I forget how she worded it and that she thinks that he had basically had Letitia's number. You know what I mean? He knew mm -hmm. all, all about her. I, I agree. I th think that, um, I think that because I agree, I think because he was so sensitive, I think that he did, um, notice when she was about to, you know, twist off. And I think he tried his hardest to basically stay out of the, you know, not to be on the receiving end. But I think for whatever reason, she just targeted him. Yeah. Well, I'd like to know how she treated Lena, but I thought it was really interesting in that interview, which you guys, we talked about it. Landon's interview with police. We didn't play the video, but I went in and transcribed it and typed it up word for word. And we went over, her brother was there and we went over it. And in that interview, I'm sure most of you guys have seen it, but if you haven't, her brother makes a comment how when Al was gone for work and Letitia was, you know, Letitia had Gannon and Lena that Lena was oftentimes with Letitia, but Gannon was always at Landon's and at Landon's brother or, you know, Landon's mom, their, their family. I don't mm -hmm. know, who, but, but with the family and that um, 
Letitia said she couldn't handle Gannon at that time. So I thought that was really interesting. It, it makes me wonder. And little boys and little girls are different. And especially if he was hyperactive, you know what I mean? But she t says at the trial that um, she says at the trial that, you know, she actually Gannon was actually her favorite or something like that. And it's like, well, damn, that scares me for Lena. But I don't think that's true. Having heard that from uh, Landon's brother. Yeah. Boys. I, I think for Letitia, I wonder um, if that was prior to um, Gannon's diagnosis and then getting on medication for ADHD, um, because that might have been why. And boys, boys just have a tremendous amount of energy and they're always climbing on. I mean, they're just boys. They just do boy stuff. They climb on things. They um, every, every joke is about a fart or poop or they're just, they just, yes. you know, and That's if you truth. are used to rate, if you've only raised one child, you know, you, it's, she only raised Harley and I'm not diminishing the difficulty of raising a child alone, but when you only have one, it's a lot different because there's no fighting when there's only one kid, who are they going to fight with themselves, their toys? You know, yeah. there's not that argument. No, you rode in the front last time or you pushed the cart last. I can't tell y'all how many times this is probably why I can't remember stuff to this day because I was forever keeping track of who pushed the cart last, who picked the cereal last. You know what I mean? I always had to keep all that stuff in my brain. And now I can't remember people's names. So <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny, but so sweet. And just, yeah, just reminds me of, of mine. There is Mel Mel's comment. Highly sensitive trait comes with depth of processing and noticing subtleties. E evil adults can tell when a highly sensitive child has their number. Well, that's true. That is so true. And I'm all, I'm sensitive and I also can like, and yeah, that is just so, so true. You will notice things that other people won't. You'll notice tone even, even through the internet and the computer. It's just, I know. And stuff. Yeah. I know. Because Allie um, sometimes be like, I kind of was wondering. I kind of <laughs> felt like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you too, Mind of Monsters. I love all you guys. I really do. And I appreciate you guys. Yeah, there's times where like I've reach out to people and I'm like, is something wrong? And they're like, how did you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I could just tell by your text and so-and-so's chat that you were off. And they're like, huh? And <laughs> said this or whatever, you know, I could just, I don't know. I can't explain it. I could just feel it. Um, but anyways, okay. I guess I'm going to let you guys go unless you guys have anything else you want to add to this, uh, topic of conversation or about anything, honestly. Um, Nope. No, okay. I'm good. I'm good. All I right. think I finally, ex I have, I'm getting around to the acceptance phase where I'm, I'm about, I'm accepting that I'm not going to resolve the situation with the candle. Yeah. I'm just not. Can't get it out of your mind. That's what I mean mm -hmm. by that. This stuff, stuff is tough. Like, um, I'll never forget when those photos came out and, um, they were like, I, Whenever I seen them, yeah, it's just you can't get them out of your head. You really cannot. Mm -hmm. Even like the the from trial when the, on the little screen, and I don't know. It's just awful, yeah. awful and horrific, and I can't. I don't know. So it it's nice to have it to have like people like you guys where it helps you like stay a little bit sane through all the like really tough stuff that's just so cra like crazy, and it's hard to even know about much less like dig deep into um like the people around you you guys you guys in the chat make it so much better for sure yes so. and they Cece, do that is sweet all right you guys oh thank you toby bird dash thank you that is so mm -hmm. sweet um all right you guys i'm gonna let you go I guess, you know, we talked about doing that live in the future about um, stuff from court. If we do something like that, anything else until we get our stuff from the court, I want to do that fundraiser. I want to do it, you know, 
I don't know if anybody yeah. has an idea. Maybe the next live we do here on my channel can be the fundraiser. That's about Letitia. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, you guys. I, I love and appreciate you guys. I hope you have a great night. Thank you to everybody for being here and going through all of this with us. Um, definitely check out their channels in the description box and all of the channels that the Nightbot has dropped throughout the live um, and the websites like Nays and Lori's and Crime Curious. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love and appreciate you and hope you have a great night and I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.